Today's video going to be playing a game of Madden 24, talking about kind of what I'm doing, going through it. Uh, wanted to drop a video kind of explaining something, a couple things as well as we kind of head into kind of the, the off season as well as with Madden 25 coming out here in a few short months and, and college football 25 actually coming out uh, in hopefully July. I think the Madden 25 beta literally starts next month and then we're going to be into college football season. And so wanted to kind of, um, you know, break some stuff down as we kind of head into that. I know a lot of you guys are looking for as Dickerson just absolutely <laughs> takes me to the house. I'm not even going to try to catch him. My team's a little bit out of date. Uh, we'll just let that be what it is. Um, but I know a lot of you guys are trying to get better at Madden, and I also know a lot of you guys are probably going to be very interested in, in, in looking to get better at NCAA as well when NCAA drops and so or college football. It's going to take me a long time to realize that it's college football because I played NCAA forever. So what we're going to do for that on our channel and what we're going to do for that on our uh, as far as ebooks and stuff go is we actually started a new website uh, or a new online community because I found that Patreon was a little bit difficult to navigate for people, and this new platform called School is going to do a much, much better job of just making it easier for you guys to access all of your eBooks, all of your pro tips, and also a much better user interface for allowing you to get your questions answered, have Q and A's, and all of that stuff. So we're switching over to School, School.com slash Cody Ballard. I'll put a link to that in the description. It's the same exact price as our Patreon membership was. It's just ten dollars a month and it gets you access to all of our offensive and defensive ebooks so if you want to get better at Madden if you want to get better at NCAA I think it's the best place to get better because we're going to be running content for an entire year on both games a lot of people um, they will just basically play college football until Madden comes out and then they all go all in on Madden we're actually going to do we're going to be going all in on both games so we're going to have full a full year's worth of ebook support in ebook releases for college football and for Madden for the same price. Just $10 gets you in. And as kind of a little bonus for those of you guys that sign up early on our school.com page, the first 500 people to sign up on our school.com platform, they will get a free complete film review from me on really as much film as they want as many games as they want uh, we're going to be doing film reviews for people trying to help people give them actionable advice that is going to help them you know become better uh, Madden and and hopefully as well college football players so if you guys want to get access to that make sure you're in that site again it's only ten dollars to join and I think it's the best place uh, to become a better Madden player that being said what I wanted to talk about in terms of Madden and college football today is kind of my uh, my strategy or my my system or my approach to thinking about offense and and defense and really we're going to start with offense and we'll kind of work to defense but basically the idea or the philosophy that I have and have really found works best over the over the last decade I've been playing Madden for I, I, I literally started my YouTube channel in Madden twelve. Started playing Madden fairly seriously in Madden 10, Madden 11, uh, but got pretty decent at Madden 12. So, anyways, that's kind of how it's kind of my Madden story. So I've been playing Madden for quite a while, and in my time <laughs> uh, playing Madden, I kind of found this basic framework that you want to think through, and it is power counter constraint. And the re I actually took this from a real NFL team. The night I was a super big fan. Uh, super, super fan of Vince Lombardi and the 60s Packers, done a lot of research on them. And what I found in studying them was they were famous for running the Lombardi sweep. The Lombardi sweep, Lombardi, literally it's a direct quote. He said, this is a play we must make go. This is a play we will make go. And this is a play we're going to run again and again and again. They committed to the power sweep. They established the power sweep. They mastered the power sweep. I believe that one of the coaches uh, in a coach's clinic that Vince Lombardi was a part of, he literally talked for almost or over an hour on the intricate de details of the blocking in the power sweep and how it changed based off of, you know, what front you were giving them, for example. The point is they had a power play. They had a power play that they committed to and that they mastered and that they executed at a super high level. And there was a very specific defense that they had to – that, that, that would be able to defend the power sweep. And that was really the, the Landry 4-3 flex defense, which where the 4-3 defense kind of came from. 
And it was really this idea of trying to kind of set the edge, uh, really this 4-3, even 6-1. This was kind of the method to defending the Packer sweep. So what was vulnerable or what was left vulnerable by 4-3, even 6-1, you might ask? Well, it was oftentimes what was known as the counter or the power trap. Uh, so the counter or the power trap, just a little quick hitter, looks like the power sweep, but the blocking kind of cuts and you're able to really attack the middle of the defense versus the edges of the defense. So the counter kind of took it, the counter play took advantage of the over pursuing nature that was required to stop the power play. That is a really important point. And I hope that you don't miss, if you don't, if you miss everything else I said in the video, please don't miss that. The counter play took advantage of what the power of what you had to do to defend the power play. The counter play took advantage of what you had to do to defend the power play. That is so, so, so important, guys, because in Madden, that is pretty much the philosophy and the strategy for the schematics. You want to have a play that you establish, a high percentage, good quality play that beats the majority of defenses that you will face. And it can be a lot of different things. It could be a stretch. It could be a bubble screen. It could be a rollout. It could be, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do. You just have to pick one. You just have to pick what are you, what are you going to commit to? What are you going to get good at? And there's reasons why people choose certain things. You know, some people, you know, this, this is also where you kind of get the term meta, most effective play in Madden 24, probably double post. Double post, one of the best plays in the game this year. Double corner is a really good play. You can make a power play out of all of those. It's just whatever it is that you want to commit to and establish. That is, that is the important, like, big, big, big point, okay? So you have a power play. And that power play can only really be defended by a couple of very specific adjustments that your opponent can do. That is important. So they have to do something to stop you. If they don't have to do anything to stop you, then it's not really that good of a play, and it's going to be hard to commit to that play over and over and over again. So that, that, that's a big, big point, and that's, that's a huge point for the power play. And you have to have a good power play. If you don't have a good power play, then your counter play really doesn't matter, all right? And that's a super underrated point. If you don't have a good power play, your, your counter play, it really doesn't matter if you have the best counter play in the world. If, it, if your power play is not putting the defense in a position where they have to be vulnerable, then your counter play is not going to make that big of a difference. So you have to have a good counter or a power play. And not only do you have to have a good play, but you have to be able to execute that play at a high level, a repeatable level, a level that you can do again and again and again. That is super, super important, guys. Super important. So, you know, that, that to me, it, it just really can't be over, overstated how important a good power, a quality, good quality power play is in the picture of schematics. Right. So then the next thing that is important, and there are other things that are important, is understanding. Wow, I can't believe you completed that. What your power play, what your what, what is open when, or what what they have to do to take away your power play and what that then leaves open, because it almost always is going to leave something open for you from a counterplay perspective. So, for example, this 4-3, even 6-1 defense, it's a pretty good job against stretches. It's a pretty good job against um, certain types of runs. And then there are some other plays or some other runs that it doesn't do you know, nearly as good against. So that's important to kind of think through as well. Uh, it kind of plays into the whole idea of power counter uh, constraint, okay? So from a power perspective, and this is – you can I'm going to use my Jets offense to kind of think help kind of bring this home so in the Jets playbook the power play is really the uh, double corner double corner is the best double corner in the game the corner strike double corner is really good and I think he fumbled there <laughs> um, the double corner is really good out of that and you need to be committing to the double corner A double corner is the best so it's the best play in the formation it's the best play in the formation it's the best play in the playbook so why is that important? Because we want to understand then what does the defense have to do to defend double corner well? Number one, they can user it. 
But really, if they use it, it's going to be tight, and they're going to have to you know, do a lot to stop that backside drag. The second thing that they can do is they can run a kind of cut of a roll coverage or cover three cloud type of defense. And that has to come or that has to roll over the top of the bunch side. Uh, and then the other thing they can do is run kind of like a cover three double flat. It's a little bit more unique than a, it's not a cover two double Mabel. It's a cover three double flat. The reason that's important is because if they run a cover three double flat, the cover three double flat here to the right side, it's not going to be able to defend it's not going to be able to defend some of the other things we can do. Another thing they can do is blitz us, which this guy might be ready to do here. You know, he might be able to send the goons. But guess what? We have these quick reads, and we we love when that happens when they just strip you after you throw a wide open player, even though he's playing like an absolute bot. So, anyways, that's the idea. There's only a couple of things that they can do to defend. You know what we do from a power play perspective, right? So what then matters is, okay, so there's only a couple things that they can do to defend our number one thing. So we want to make sure that our number two thing, our counter, cannot be defended by the, de the same defense that can defend our power play. And I know it sounds super basic. Man, that is an important point. It, it really is. Uh, a lot of people don't, don't, they don't really do that. They kind of just call money play after money play after money play that doesn't really fit together. Um, Peyton Manning was famous for this and this, I've done a lot of research on his offense as well, you know, but they basically had that kind of, if then this, that structure within their offense. And they wanted to call plays that, that really fit together. They're also famous for not having a lot of plays uh, and having not a lot of formations. They wanted to make everything look the same so that, you know, basically pre-snap you're given the same, kind of general look that you're given, you know, otherwise. So that's another kind of element to the way that they played, uh, to the way that they played the game. So you don't need a lot of plays is, is, is what I'm trying to say. If you execute those plays at a high level and you understand kind of what they're actually able to do to stop you, that is super, super important. So when you go to your counterplay, then you are inevitably going to call up a counterplay, of course. You just want to make sure, like in this case, Durham, it can't really be defended the same way that corner strike can be defended, right? There's just so much. There's just so many things. Like right here, you see there's that post wide open. He has to drop a 30-yard flat back to, to defend that. And then, you know, we kind of get into this, if this, then that game. And that's really where constraint theory plays come in. So a constraint theory play – in the context that we were just talking about, about like the Packers and stuff, a constraint theory play is really good for if they start to get over aggressive, they start to blitz a lot of people, they start to do a lot of stuff like that, then we want to go to what we call constraint theory plays. Constraint theory plays are plays that we call to ensure that we are living in a perfect world. The reason they're called constraint theory plays is they're meant to constrain the defense and basically take advantage of super overzealous and over pursuing defenses. And as you see, the RPO is the perfect example of that. When they start blitzing a lot of people, when they start doing a lot of stuff, that's where, you know, really this RPO type stuff is really effective. And it's really, you know, it's, it's really effective from, again, that power counter constraint type of thinking. They can't defend the RPO the same that they can defend the double corner the same that they can defend Durham. That's the basic structure of if this, then that, and really why you call what you call. You have to have a purpose and a plan for that. I do think that one of the big weaknesses of the air raid offense, if you look at uh, college football and you kind of watch and you say, okay, what's the big weaknesses of air raid or wh where does things kind of break down? The biggest challenge for air raid offenses is typically on the drop eight coverages. They the 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 super you know drop eight max coverage double Mabel cover four drop with yellows, kind of the standard like super super drop back defenses. Those defenses tend to do better against air raid the bend but don't break style of defense. The reason that that's important to kind of think through is where does the air raid need to get better? Well, they need to get better at beating drop eight coverages. One of the best ways to beat drop eight coverages is, you know, what's the weakness of a drop eight coverage? If we just if we just think about it, like a drop eight coverage would be like what I'm doing right here at a Mabel. What's the biggest weakness of double Mabel? The biggest weakness of double Mabel is, number one, 
the fact that the I mean, yeah, you only have two deep zones, but really the biggest weakness of it is the pressure. There's not a lot of pressure. You're only sending three people. So you're forcing your opponent to be patient and find the holes in the coverage. And double Mabel, um, you know, for all the flack that it gets, it doesn't have a lot of holes in the coverage, right? There are holes in the coverage. It's mainly in the middle of the field, but there's really not a lot of holes for them to find. And so if they're not intentional about planning for that, they're not going to have a, a constraint theory play to manipulate that. So another good example of a constraint theory play would be a double Mabel beater, right? A Maybe a one-play touchdown against cover two, a one-play touchdown against cover three, a one-play touchdown against cover four. Those are good examples of kind of constraint theory methods that can do a really good job of manipulating when they're getting stagnant, when they're staying in the same thing, when, you know, you know what I mean? Um, so like, for, for example, having a good, you know, kind of cover two Mabel, like, for example, a tight offset tight end is a great one. The play PA seams has a corner route that if you put a streak, it's going to get over the top of a double flat or double Mabel coverage. So it's a great little, what again, I would call a constraint theory play, right? Or maybe a really good man beater. Uh, for example, this play out of PA boot over, this is a really good man beating route, route combo. Now he's not running a lot of man, so it might not work here. Um, as I almost get shamed and fumbled, but you see what I'm saying? So you have constraint three plays. There's really probably a couple of those. Those are just sp really specific play calls. When you start to really say, okay, they're probably going to do X, Y, Z. That's where these constraint theory plays are really, really, really helpful. Uh, when, you know, so for example, like this guy here, you know, kind of, kind of getting, kind of getting cute with uh, some man ups and stuff. This might be a really, really good play for him, right? We just read out here, throw a little flat, take our read, stuff like that. Um, the idea of constraint theory plays. But again, all of these plays are ultimately high percentage plays that have a specific purpose that cannot be overstated. They are high percentage plays that have a specific purpose when called. Right off the bat, he dots me with this kind of like unique little crossing route from, it's not just from Trey White Flex, it's from Trips, but it's a really nice little route. And I honestly just haven't played I'll be honest, I just haven't played the way he was running his trips different than what I've seen, uh, truly different than what I've seen. I'm trying to remember. I don't even know for sure. I think this is Chiefs playbook, but I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly. And and I have kind of a brain fart in the beginning of this game. I don't have my, my deep out zone KO on the left side, which actually ends up hurting me a lot in this. So you'll see here, I mean, right off the bat, he's kind of dotting me down the field. And I don't normally give up much to trips. I feel like my trips D is pretty good. And he just starts kind of like hitting just pock, like hitting little spots that I hadn't seen before. So kind of getting set up here. And um, also kind of on, I was actually on the phone. I, I got in a uh, car accident the other day. So I was actually on the phone while I was playing the first part of this. I'd planned to do this recording, but I uh, was on the phone kind of dealing with the car stuff. So Anyways, here, uh, off bat, just, yeah, I mean, it's honestly just really bad user by me right there, and I just played bad for the first half, really, like, the entire first drive, he was just doing stuff that I had not seen a lot, and this is the kind of the power of off meta, you know, I talk a lot about why I think meta is really important, but if you have a legitimate scheme, here goes a bunch strong offset, he might be in Bears playbook, uh, he's got to be in Jets, I feel like he has to be in Jets, actually. I don't know. I, I don't know what his playbook was here, but um, I'm also surprised he was in this Trey Y flex versus trip side and offset. But anyway, he's just kind of audibling around a little bit. And uh, I actually have a couple of plays in this game that are really bad and a couple of plays that are really good. So kind of goes to something. Just don't see stuff like this a lot. So when you are playing something that you haven't seen a lot, um, if they're really good at the offense, be prepared. Like they might get a couple early uh, touchdowns. You're trying to kind of evaluate what are, and, and the other thing you're trying to do is when you're playing something that you haven't really labbed against, like he's actually running a bunch strong down here. And I noticed, okay, there's the RPO. I was wondering when we're going to see that get him on a fourth down, which I feel like, okay, perfect. And really when you play someone and you, they're running just kind of some stuff that you just haven't seen before, my advice would be, Try as hard as you can to play a little bit more basic and just try to, and that was just terrible. I can't believe I gave that up. 
but try to play a little bit more basic and then try to like relate what you're seeing to something that you've seen before, right? Relate what you're seeing to something you've seen before. Even his defense was a little bit off meta to me. Like he's in six one here, which is pretty standard, but he'll do some stuff that's just kind of like I just haven't seen it. So let's start out with the RPO, try to get on a hash, get a nice play, get out, and uh, automatically I'm like, all right, this is going to be an easy win. But then he just starts doing some stuff defensively that I, like I said, I just had not seen. He starts to man a line and come out and, and I don't even, I think this is a nickel. I don't know. He starts to man a line like cover two man. I feel like this should have been a touchdown. Is it a touchdown? Did I catch it? No, I drop it. Yeah, I kind of feel like that should have been a touchdown. I got gift wrapped on. I feel like that was a pretty good read. And um, yeah, I just, I don't know. Kind of the story of this game really comes down to I feel like I just missed a couple reads and called some bad plays. Like, just for the way he was playing, I uh, kind of called some bad plays. This was my, I believe this was my first game in the morning. And so sometimes whenever you play your first game, you know, you're just kind of, you know, I don't know, just call some bad plays. So anyway, right there, Dagger, really good play call against zone. I mean, he actually just did a really good job of kind of mixing up what he was doing. He was either in man or zone. And he would do random alignment stuff that I just had not really been comfortable with. Hadn't seen a lot of this stuff. Like, you see the linebackers over the center. Just stuff like that. Like, you just haven't seen it. And anyway, so here, I don't know what I'm even... I'm going to this red zone play. End up getting a delay. You know, just like kind of like just... I don't know. Just not very uh, not very sharp offensively for me. This is not a very sharp game by any means. I got a lot of... And this was the main problem. If you look there on that, on that last play... The tight end just kind of ran into the tackle. I got a lot of that this game of these like bad animations, bad bumping animations. And I just feel like they really affected my precision offensively. I could not get in a real good rhythm in the first half for sure. And like I said, it's just a different formation almost every single play. Like I think this, I don't even know what this is. Like 4-3 four, four, under. Like I don't, I don't know what he's running. I don't know what I'm running. <laughs> I don't know why I was running a wide trail post this close to the end zone. But I mean, everybody, everybody's bagged. Check down the running back actually didn't go too bad for me. Get on in third down. Go to the RPO here. Just trying to sneak a seven. Just trying to honestly sneak seven in. And I feel like that's got to be a touchdown. But it doesn't make a bad play. And then here, this is a terrible play call. I'd never do this. On fourth and goal, why would you run the ball on fourth and goal? You just don't give yourself enough opportunities. And he was playing good red zone defense. He ends up getting a stop. And now I'm like, crap, I got to you know lock in here. So... He goes, uh, and like I said, just this random Trey Y flex inside zone. And inside the inside zone from Trey Y flex is harder to stop than the inside zone from trips. In my opinion, just the way the blocks line up are a little better. And so there are some 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 definite benefits to to your uh, Trey Y flex type scheme. So here, get a sack, kind of sent everybody, trying to kind of force a safety. Third and 11, and I feel like in general, just my defense this game, like it was in the first half, especially in the first half, it was just kind of, ah, just it just it was like close to getting a stop, and then just, I don't know, like right here, I mean, who calls an RPO bubble on third and 11? You know, I guess my man, JV, JVK. Well, fourth and three, feel good about getting him on a fourth down again. And then I got a really nice KO. Uh, that's just mid zone being mid zone, man. You got to have mid zone. Your back four and dollars should all have deep zone KO and mid zone KO. I think they're the most important abilities in ga in the game. I actually think they're more important than pick artists. Um, but pick artists are probably the second most important. But the KOs are so you need to have KOs everywhere. Really important to me. All right, so here I'm like, all right, let's get it back. Let's get it to an actual red zone play that I've ran before. So I go to my standard one, but I mean, he just blitzes me, and I had a touchdown. I had three, I had two touchdowns there, and just, uh, just, just missing reads, you know, just not playing well. And when you're not playing well, like you're not playing well, you know, and you got to kind of, I don't know, just come back to some of the basics, you know, come back in here, get another random bump. I got a great animation and actually get in for seven here, so. Uh, great. That was a high point free form outside up and out and was able to kind of just put it where only my receiver could get it. It was either my thought there was like, I'm either going to throw a touchdown or I'm going to throw an incomplete pass, but I'm not throwing a pick on that because I highballed it. Uh, and so it's just, it's hard. It's a hard trajectory for him to be able to play. Now I'm feeling like, okay, I got to stop here. This is my stop. Now I'm going to, you know, kind of get back to playing good defense. You know, the KOs are the KOs. That's why I say they're so, so important. And, Second and ten. I, I mean, you just watch this game and you're like, man, there's so many, so many little things. But 
I'm gonna send the a gap here you know like look how long that play action takes and he just throws that and then uh we can't make a tackle there get up for five you know just just kind of one of those games man where you know you're you're so then what happens is as we start to kind of do this especially on this drive I start to get really aggressive. That's where I notice my KO is not out there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my KO is not out there. You know, my, my mid zone and deep out KO is at slot corner right now, which is not where it's supposed to be. Um, so here I go to one of my favorite defenses for trips. I love this defense, just some man ups and stuff. And then he just dots me. I mean, that's just mm, got on my, got clicked on my, my defensive lineman here. I'm switching my KO. I saw it. So I'm like, okay, let's get that switch. I don't know why Traverius Ward is, I don't know why I put him at slot corner. But anyway, let's get back into some defense here. So I'm thinking, okay, just hold the three. You know, you'll be fine. Go to a pretty aggressive defense. But I love this defense against Trips. One of my favorites. Uh, just some cross manning. Ends up running the ball. And uh, second and six, runs the ball again. Third and six, third and five. Goes to this bunch strong. I feel like it's one of my better plays of the game. This is where I feel like I thought I was going to win. As you see, I just shoot the RPO well. Able to get out there. Able to make the pick. And I feel like that was a pretty good play. Like, Again, if this is why I like to stand right here. And again, it's just it's just, you know, running out there, didn't get blocked, and got the pick. So he just kind of fat fingered it out there, kind of assumed it'd be open, able to take advantage of that. Now I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm now I'm gonna go win the game, put my foot on him. You know, uh, phone call's probably over at this point, throw my corner route, and now I'm feeling good. I'm like, okay, got back in rhythm. Now we're back, you know, seven to seven in a really good in a really good spot, right? In a really good spot. Now, the thing, the kind of the mistake I make, I feel like, in this in this game, too, is I also start to kind of, I don't know, think a little bit about managing the clock. Because he was just doing some weird stuff. Like, like you see here, like, this is just kind of weird. You know, a man of mine dollar, and I feel like my play call is not terrible, you know, and I just, uh, my trail route's standing wide open, but I get shedded. Third and 12 now. I'm like, okay, let's go to this other way to beat man. Love this combo. And this is just a bad read. I had a touchdown. I had the post for a touchdown. I don't know what I was looking at. I mean, I know I can't throw that corner out against cover two. And I, I guess maybe it, I don't even know. It's just kind of like he, huh, it's, this is why sometimes defensively, sometimes the best defense is just changing the coverage up. It truly is. Sometimes the best defense is just changing the coverage up. This is a terrible play call by me. He's showing me man coverage. I go to dagger, and everybody just bumps each other, and nobody gets open. Gets shedded, and here we go. So that was terrible. That was a really, really bad sequence by me, and actually puts him in a good spot. So now he's back, and then he just throws this, and ah, <laughs> you can't go for that pick right there. My user or my guy goes for the pick. Just terrible decision by me. Gets him in a red zone spot, first and goal. Probably going to run the ball. He loves to run the ball. And then I'm thinking, okay, well, I've been playing pretty decent red zone defense, and then I do something that I just think is silly by me. I kind of overthink it again, and I go to 3-4 odd, and then he just runs inside zone and gets seven. So now I'm thinking, okay, you got to go down. You got to get some points. 26 seconds, two timeouts. Even if you just get three, um, I get ball at halftime. You know, so that's, that's kind of the, the thought process. Go down and get three. Uh, kind of make the best of a bad situation. And, and really a self-inflicted one, you know. I mean, I've had I've had two. I think I got stopped two or three times offensively this game, and just and you know again, they're just uncomfortable, like just doing some random stuff, and it just shows the power. I think of, you know, sometimes the off meta, you know, can you know, and not even just off meta, but just like doing different things. There's some bumping again. My clear out doesn't clear that out, and then I get sacked. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm actually not going to get points here. So, you know, I'm seeing a lot of cover two. So I go to one of my favorite plays against cover two. It's that wide trail play. It's the play that I missed earlier. And I'm thinking, okay, if his user stays down on the drag or the tight end, I'm going to throw the post. That's basically my thought process. I'm really only looking for that. Um, or at least that's my main, what I want to do. I see he sits on the trail. I'm able to throw the post, get a nice catch. And now we're back out in business. And with 11 seconds, no timeouts, I need, a, I need about 10 yards uh, for like a comfortable field goal. So I go to this play. And basically the thought process with this play is just to try to pull his user. So I'm trying to take put his user to the post and then throw the tight end over the middle. And then also look to the corner. You see cover two, but he actually puts a middle third there. So I'm like, okay. And then his user still goes to the post. So I'm able just to check down to the tight end and basically get out of half with uh, with three there. So, so now 10 to 14, not a terrible uh, situation. He actually, 
I actually get a crazy um I actually get a pick here. So I get an interception and I'm like, oh my gosh, I might be able to crib this. You know, I'm about to take over the game. It's to be a huge shift, and I just can't get it done. Can't get it done. But I do get balled half. So this is a really important drive. Really, really important drive out of half. I feel like I've I feel like if I could get in the lead, it would put a lot more pressure on him. And my defense would ultimately be able to come away with the stop. So this is a big drive for me. And I just, like I said, I've been playing really sloppy, able to reset at halftime, even just for a second, and just kind of get back to fundamentals. So here I go to dagger. I actually love this throw. I feel like I wish this was a catch, man. I I probably got it just a little bit too far to the left, but that's a great, in my opinion, that's a great throw because he doesn't have a he doesn't have a KO on that player. But anywho, so here we're going to go to Durham and just try to, this is just a yard gainer. This is just, you know, it's like a designed to be a yard gainer here. I have the running back, throw the running back, and then I get hit as I throw. And you see, like, just some of this random stuff was really bugging me. Um, you know, just kind of like he'd go zone and then he'd go man and then he'd man a line and then he'd put the safeties in the box. I mean, it was just a bunch of random stuff. You see here again, man a line, you know, so I'm like, okay, let's just. Maybe stop giving this guy a little too much credit and just say, okay, he's giving me a man look. I'm going to run a man beater. So I go to PA, but over one of my favorite ways to beat man coverage, tight end gets open, throw it, get up, and uh, get some good yardage there. First and 10, ball about midfield, and we will see what happens. So 4-3, uh, even 6-1. I'm going to go to dagger, and I'm kind of thinking the same thing on the left side. So here I see I got one-on-one. -on -one. And I just like my chances with that fade route. As you see, able to get a nice throw and uh, able to get in for six. So really nice. Uh, big seven. Big, big, big drive from me. And so now I'm up three. And like I said, I feel like when I got up, I feel like he was going to play a little different offensively. I feel like I could have got a, I could get a stop. You know, even if I hold the three, it just allows me to be in, in more control of the situation, more control of the game which is uh, is kind of the idea here. So Trey White Flex again. And, and like I said, this was kind of a weird offense, you know, like just random stuff was open that isn't normally open. And um, all, a combination of that and playing kind of bad, just playing bad in general. And then here you see good read, drag. And he's hitting the, he's just hitting the pockets that's open. I mean, it's, it's good reads by him. First and 10 uh, here. So basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to start using this defense alignment on the right side. I feel like that's one of the best ways to stop a trip set like this. And I feel like this was really good defense, but then I just get – actually, no, I get him right here, but then he gets out of there and gets 10. I feel like that was perfect defense, and he's able to get out of there and get 10 yards. Again, he hasn't really liked that coverage. It's probably my favorite coverage, but then he does something that I have not seen much. He goes to bunch tight end, and I'm in the same coverage. Uh, this was a bad call by me, bad decision. I should have checked out of this. I shouldn't have stayed in this. I thought this would play a little better, but I didn't realize how misaligned I was, and uh, the man coverage just did not man cover very well. So first and 10, ball in the 14. Kind of need to hold the three here. I don't have to, but you really, like, in this situation, you don't want to, you know, you really do want to hold a three. He's going to go probably to the RPO. No, he goes to trail. Mid zone, able to do what mid zone does. Yeah, he just kind of did some odd stuff. And, and sometimes when, you know, again, the more complicated your opponent becomes, the more simple you need to play. The more simple you need to play. So here, seven and five. I got clicked on the wrong guy. I was trying to get on the D end. I actually get a sack here. This is a big play by big, big play by the defense. Puts him in a third and nineteen. So now I'm like, okay, this is my stop right here. I'm able to get off field. I'm gonna go to my favorite trips defense. It's the man ups on the left. You see uh, Ward plays out of his mind good and able to get the pick and able to get the stop. So that was huge. So now we not only hold a three, but we also get a, we get a set or a interception. So we're, now we're able to go down, potentially get seven, and really swing the, mo swing the entire pendulum you know, more so in our favor than already is. So kind of go to just some basic stuff here. I think I'm going to go to basic PA, but over. But he's showing me his own look. And this is where, again, this is where there is some value. I have triangle standing wide open. I just didn't see it. There is a lot of value. This is another thing that changing your look up a lot will do. When you give somebody a, a different look a lot, they start to miss reads. 
because they can't really get into a rhythm. And that's really the story of this game for me offensively. I could not get in a rhythm. Um, I made a couple of plays to, I made enough plays to win the game, but I also made plenty of plays to lose the game. You know, his, his, um, him just mixing stuff up, giving me a bunch of different looks. It really did mess with me a little bit, you know, and I'm just missing reads that I would never miss. Some of this, obviously, first game of the day and all that, but more so than that, I mean, I think it's just, you know, he just played pretty good, pretty good. Here, I see this on the left side. So he's running cover zero here, and this is this is just kind of a little pro tip about cover zero. If you don't shade, generally speaking, just cover zero in general is just the, the way they just don't, they just run weird uh, with streak routes. And so able to hit him, get seven, and uh, that's going to put me up two scores, and he's going to be out of here. So I think this does a really good job of showing kind of how powerful Dollar can truly be. Uh, here kind of goes up top first play. We're able to get the interception and uh, able to take the ball away. Really nice pick by me, and uh, we're going to get an, an easy stop, kind of an easy stop first first possession. All right, anytime they'll throw you something like that, that's always good for uh, just, just kind of getting you know out in front. Now, uh, one of the things I want to talk about in terms of Madden in general today is uh, just kind of the state of the Madden 24 meta and why it is important to understand the meta as you kind of go forward. And so Madden has really changed a lot over the last couple of years and simultaneously been relatively similar. One of the ways that it's changed is uh, what has gone to next-gen. Offense has definitely changed. Users are slower than they've ever been. Uh, not necessarily slower than they've ever been, but they're progressively slower on next-gen Madden than what we've seen in you know current-gen Madden. So that has kind of changed how defense has to be played and how offense is played, really, because on offense, you don't really have to worry about the user usering more than maybe one or two routes. And so it's a big, big part of kind of the experience now on next gym with that being said it means your defense has to be a little bit more disciplined you have to uh, just be able to put better coverage on the field it's hard to sit in one defense really all game and just be able to have a really good user and, and win games this in, anymore it's you have to kind of mix up your coverages which really kind of plays into kind of a general meta that we're seeing develop in the real nfl in the real nfl we're seeing a lot of kind of split safety split field coverages too high safety looks, and really if you watch a lot of the playoff games, relatively low scoring uh, just in terms of how things worked. And the reason why is because they were able to disguise their coverages behind on the back end with split field safeties. By having two high safeties, you can change your coverage really in almost anything you want. You could be in cover three, cover four, cover two, man coverage, zone coverage, match coverage. You just have all kinds of different options. And so it makes it to where you give the same look pre-snap, but then you change the coverage in behind it post-snap. Now, uh, one of the other things that's kind of going on in the real NFL a lot is these kind of simulated pressures where we're showing a blitz from the right, but we're sending a blitz from the left, or we're showing a heavy blitz, and then we drop out and play coverage. Those are some of the other things that you're starting to see kind of develop as a general overarching meta in, in the real NFL. So I think some of this uh, does kind of explain a little bit uh, in terms of you know what you need to do defensively in Madden, you know one of the th one of the principles that's really always been true of Madden is you need to have a blitz threat. No matter what defense you're running, you need to have some type of way in which you are going to get pressure on the quarterback. Just like in the real NFL, if you can get pressure on the cornerback, and the less people that you have to send to get that pressure, the more likely of a chance that you're going to have at being able to throw off and constrain space. Uh, throw off or uh, contain closing or uh, take away throwing windows as well as speed the quarterback up. So pressure has always been a necessity in Madden for sure, because it's really one of the only major tools in my opinion that we have defensively. Number one is that we, you know, just have to be able to get pressure. Uh, the second tool that you have in your toolkit defensively is really your, uh, your ability to change the look post snap, your ability to adjust to the offense, your ability to give them the same look, but the defenders are rolling into different zones and taking away different space and, and all of that. So that's one of the other real big keys, I think, to defense is you have to be able to take away the most amount of space possible and also do it while making everything look the same. As you see here in this throughout this game, pretty much this is my main defensive look. I press the defense, then I back off the slot corner on the right. We either send three, send four, send five. 
out of that look. And then every now and then I'll send uh, DB Fire 2 from the same basic look. And then really the main thing that's changing in behind this is just kind of how I'm adapting the coverage based off of just where he's trying to attack. There's some other things that's really important, and it kind of comes down to the fundamental principle of defense, in my opinion. And that is the fundamental defensive principle that is, I think, the most important is the idea of space constraint. Offenses try to create space. Defenses try to constrain space. And the reason that that's significant for our purposes today is because the defense is trying to constrain the space, based off of where the ball is at on the field, it actually changes where the space actually is for the offense as well. So, for example, if he's running a short side bunch, that's going to be defended differently than a wide side bunch. And there's just different routes and different plays that you have to be aware of based off of hash mark. Another really underrated aspect of Madden that a lot of people don't think about in terms of defense is the playbook your opponent is running. The playbook your opponent is running is super, super important to be aware of. The playbook that your opponent is running can give you a lot of information about what is possible. The, the playbook they're running, the abilities they're running, I don't know how I give that up on 4th of 21, but the playbook that they are running, the defense, or I'm sorry, the playbook they're running, the formation they're running, where they're at on the field, the abilities they're running offensively, those all communicate different things. For example, in, in earlier in the year, you were only able to have like a slot apprentice, maybe a tight end apprentice, maybe a backfield apprentice. And so it would limit the type of route combos you could put on the field. Another thing that's important is my opponent is running the Colts playbook, and you would probably want to defend the Colts playbook a little bit differently than you might want to defend the West Coast Bunch playbook, for example. So the reason I'm saying that is by having a good knowledge, uh, a good knowledge of playbook awareness, it can really. I don't know how. I feel like I, I feel like he kind of used that, and I don't know that he. I don't know how he was able to use that actually, to catch up to that route, with a 90, 90, 95 speed maybe Ray Lewis at the most probably, but anyways, so playbook knowledge is super important. My opponent is running the Colts playbook. So what are the main plays that you need to be aware of from Colts? Well, they have a lot of C routes, so you have to under, You have to really kind of wrestle with, is your opponent willing to throw C routes? So far, I don't think he's thrown a single C route, okay? Uh, so that's that's part of it. The second thing that's important to wrestle with here, I can't believe I I can't believe I went for the pick there. I know better than to go for the pick there. you got to just let the KO do its work. But the second thing is, what are the most powerful plays? So from Colts, you have double post, right? So you have to have a plan for double posts. Most, when they're in bunch offset, you've got to be aware of really a couple plays. you got to be aware of verticals. Double post, smash return, and every now and then you're going to get Z-spot and go from a really, really advanced player. Those are the main plays that you're going to get from Bunch Offset and Colts. What are the main plays you're going to get from Bunch Strong Nasty and Colts? You're going to get Dagger, you're going to get Mesh Flat Spot, you're going to get Wide Trail, and you're going to get um, the RPO. Now, most and most of the time, from my experience, a lot of people are going to basically run a lot of Dagger and Mesh Flat Spot in general, or they're going to run a lot of wide trail if you're playing them in man coverage. So you can also kind of think, okay, so I'm running this defense, right? I'm running dollar with the backed off slot corner. What are the vulnerabilities of that defense that I know that my opponent is likely to attack? If I'm playing somebody that has a good offensive playbook, a good offensive system, what are they probably going to attack? And then how do I have a plan to be able to counter that, right? You always want to have... I think one of the most important things in Madden that I'm starting to really understand is you, you have to understand the why. So you have to understand why things work. Very often, a lot of people will contribute like either, um, what's the word, like RNG or I'm trying to remember what the word is, where they where they basically say, or uh, DDA, DDA, uh, RNG, randomness. Uh, they, they kind of just assume that everything is random and there are some random aspects of the game i don't want to say that there's not okay we, we've played madden long enough we understand that rng and dda that that stuff may 100 percent exist but whether it exists or not it's really outside of our control and so when we think about how we can go about becoming better madden players i think one of the most important and significant exercises to do is to ask the question why why did that route get open? Why did that blitz come in? Why did that uh, why did that coverage defense work? Why did that coverage defense not work? Why did that 
And, and there's a lot of reasons as to why. It could be because we ran the play on one hash as opposed to the other hash. It could be because it was a fade route, not a streak route. It could be because it was the double post post route, not the deep corner post route. Those are all factors. But again, just forcing yourself to stop blaming the game for everything that goes wrong, right? Stop blaming the game for everything that goes wrong. Understand that because you can't really control it. The at the end of the day, the video game is the video game. The only thing you can control is your adjustments, your inputs, what you put into the game. So uh, learn as much as possible. I think one of the easiest ways to get better at Madden is to stop thinking you know everything. I've never been a part of a community, and I've been a, I've been in the Madden community for literally 12 years now, since Madden 12. I actually started getting in into Madden seriously in Madden 10, Madden 11, and then I started the channel in Madden 12. That's a crazy lurk. <laughs> I started the channel in Madden, in Madden 12. It's probably one of the best user plays I've made all year. And being a part of this community for tw what literally 12 years now, one of the things that I've come to really believe is that it's one of the only communities, it's not the only community where it's prevalent, but it's really, I think, the biggest community where it's prevalent is there's this, there's an immense amount of pride in players in the Madden community, myself, in, myself included. And there's this, uh, I don't know if ego is the right word, I would say just pride in general, but one of the things that I've tried to get better at is a willingness to be wrong, a willingness to learn, a willingness to understand. And again, I think this will make everybody better because I've gotten comments sometimes <laughs> from people and some of the comments that I read are just, they're just objectively wrong. And the, the frustrating part about that is if you try to tell somebody they're objectively wrong, oftentimes it's not like they're going to just agree with you. And whenever you're not willing to be my mentor used to say this to me all the time, but he said, essentially, if you ever get to a point in your life where you're not willing to be coached, if you ever get to a point in your life where you're, you're not willing to be teachable or coachable, we might as this is a terrible play that I make here. I actually have a lot open. And then I just kind of dilly dally. I'm up 21 to seven. I'm honestly just kind of messing around. And then I thought he was going to keep running. He stops running that throw pick. But he said, if you ever uh, ever get to a point in your life where you're willing to, and I do a lot of coaching sessions like this, actually. Let me, let me explain this real quick. I do a lot of coaching sessions where it's almost like the, they don't really want my advice. They want me to put a stamp of approval on what they think. And to me, it's like you're paying me money to coach you, to develop you, to, help, to tell you what's in my head. And you're, all you're doing is spending your time telling me what's in your head. And I just think that's that's a bad attitude. It's just not a winning mentality because winning is on the other side of failure every single time. Uh, my One of my favorite um, – I thought I could have picked that. I was trying to really – I knew he was going to call something like that. I was trying to go for the pick, and I think we go to half here. But one of my favorite just general – I don't know if quotes quote, – quotes, I guess. It's the Michael Jordan commercial where he talks about all of the – game-winning shots that he's taken and he's missed. And he says, you know, I fail over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed, right? Failure is on the road to success. And so if you're not willing to admit when you're wrong, if you're not willing to admit when you've quote-unquote failed, and I don't think failure is final, right? Failure is not really failure. Failure is learning at, at the real core of it. But, but anyways, if you're not willing to admit when you're wrong, it's really hard to get better that's my biggest point. If you're not willing to admit somebody's better than you, and this is one of the things, man, you can learn a little bit from everybody. You know, Henry, who's, in my opinion, the best Madden player of all time, the guy that I study the most, what I, what I love about Henry is if you ever hear him, if you ever hear him give, give uh, Madden advice, like, you know, he gets a lot of this, like, you know, if I want to be on your level, what do I need to do? The thing that Henry would pretty much always unanimously say is you've got to play the game a lot. That's the first thing. But the second thing that he says is, you know, you basically want to learn as much about the game as possible. The majority of Madden is knowledge gap. And it's true. It's about 80% knowledge gap, 20% skill gap, in my opinion. I would, I would say knowledge gap is putting a good route combo on the field, whereas skill gap is making the right read on the route combo. And the same to be true of defense. I think defense is putting a good blitz on the field, putting good adjustments on the field. But this skill gap is really usering, you know, usering your responsibility well. I think that's the primary skill gap defensively. So anyways, that being said, 
you've got to be a learner. If you're not willing to put yourself in positions where you're going to fail, you'll put yourself in positions where you're going to be teachable, coachable, and learnable, it's really hard to get better at this game. And I just, I just find a lot of Madden players, they really don't want advice. And so they kind of stay average, for lack of a better word, or they kind of stay like they're really good against a bad player and then they play a good player and it's just a completely different game because they they literally don't know anything because they haven't been willing to be coached. They haven't been willing to be developed. You know, if it, and I heard this from somebody the other day, and I thought this was so accurate. They said if Tom Brady is if, – if, if Tom Brady, who's – you know, widely considered to be the greatest quarterback of all time. If he has a football coach and he has multiple coaches, what makes you think that you don't need one? <laughs> what makes you think that you don't need one? I thought that was a really good piece of advice that they gave me. But uh, anyways, biggest thing with defense, guys, make it look the same. Have pressure. Have have pressure. You don't have to send pressure every play, but you got to have a threat of pressure consistently. The other big thing about defense Again, your goal is to constrain space. Off auto alignment on base. And we'll be rocking dollar. Now, uh, I was talking about a little bit in the beginning here. What we're doing is we are actually rocking this defense with our um, deep outside corners. And they have mid zone and deep out zone KO. I think those are two. Uh, that, that stack right there is really, really good. And I'm going to explain why. So deep out zone KO, if you think about where these activate um, in terms of on your field, what we're going to notice about deep out zone KO is it pretty much activates basically outside of the hash marks. I want to say 20 yards and more. So basically any route that's over 20 yards and it's outside of the hash marks, that is where deep out zone KO is going to light up and going to activate for you. So if you touch the receiver in those uh, with the, within those uh, frames, then you're going to be able to basically knock the ball out. The problem is um, like short corners and little short C routes and wheel routes and stuff like that that a lot of people like to run, uh, deep out zone actually doesn't knock that out. So by stacking mid zone on the ability, mid zone is basically literally anything on the field that is under 20 yards. So if it's a little underneath little middle intermediate route. It doesn't really matter, but anything on the field that's under 20 yards, mid zone is going to knock is going to activate against. So what makes it really powerful is the fact that these guys will not only will they react significantly better in zone coverage, as you just saw right there, get the pick, but they will also be able to knock out literally anything on the sideline. Um, and then they're also going to be able to knock out anything kind of deep as well. So I think that's a great AP stack. It's really, I, I've really liked it a lot. Gonna get screamed at first play here. We're rocking Colts on offense and Chiefs on defense. You saw how good Dollar is. Uh, Do Dollar is just the best defense in the game. We show you in the Patreon how to run it at a really high level as well as how to adjust it, how to adapt it, how to tweak it to the best formations that you're going to be facing uh, online. And then I'm rocking Colts. Now, uh, I did want to talk about this today. So uh, what I wanted to talk about in terms of my offense is really something I've been thinking about for a while. And it's trying to be more intentional and purposeful when I play this game. As someone that creates content for a living, um, it's really, really important to me that I'm always finding something new. And while that's good for content, I always have different routes or different concepts to show people. The thing that I think actually makes worse is my gameplay. And the reason why it makes my gameplay worse is just because I don't really get a lot of good reps. And um, I don't really get like, I don't know if the word is reps, but kind of reps. Like I just don't master the reads. Um, so like uh, of the offense that I run, I don't really ever master any offense. And I think that's honestly to my uh, detriment as a Madden player. So I've been kind of on this little kick, and I talked about it in a couple of videos back, about being intentional with your play calling, understanding why you're doing what you're doing. Because I think that if you're like me, sometimes you just call random stuff, and you don't really know why you're calling it. And because you don't know why you're calling it, you don't really know what you're looking for. You don't know what you're anticipating. And it's one of the most underrated skills, I think, of a Madden player. And I think something that separates the best Madden players in the world from the average Joes like me is that... When you're at the top of your game, you can kind of anticipate what your opponent's going to do before they're going to do it. And then you can basically kind of like pre-plan for that. 
and adjust to it before it even happens. I think this is literally one of the things that, I mean, if you if you look at um, any, any good Madden player, they are able to do this at a pretty high level. Now, obviously, there's a foundation um, and fundamental concept in which you are going to come into a game, and you're going to have a game plan offensively and defensively. Um, more so, I think this applies to defensively because defensively, we have to kind of adjust to what the offense is doing. Offensively, um, you just kind of honestly need to be able to attack the whole field. If you can attack the whole field offensively, then it's going to it's going to really go well for you. It's why bunch is so good. It's why trips is so good. It's why those formations are the best formations every year because they give you the routes to be able to attack the whole entire field entirety of the field. So super super important to have the ability to be able to do that. But then if you think about it from a defensive perspective, offenses try to create space or attack space. Defenses try to basically constrain. Uh, constrained space or confined the offense and kind of like basically put players in position to be able to actually stop what the offense is, is trying to do. So if you take those two concepts in, in hand in hand and you start thinking about, okay, these are my plays or this is my system or whatever, what it comes down to is it comes back to not only do you have to master the reads, but you have to understand like right here. So he's sent these linebackers pretty much every single play. So for me to send five out might not be a smart idea. But now, as you see here, the slot corner goes to the left. So I might have this tight end. He goes right to the tight end. So I check down to the running back. Those are just different little pieces of the puzzle. Now, again, I, I've said this before. I think every offense in Madden, every single offense that is good, um, has to foundationally start with what is called a power play. A power play can pretty much be anything. It can be a run. It could be a pass. It could be anything you want it to be. But the thing about a power play is you commit to the power play. You commit to mastering the reads. You commit to mastering the setups. You commit to mastering the adjustments from it. That is the most important thing about a power play that I could possibly ever teach you is you have to master the power play. And in order for you to master the power play, in my opinion, you have to get a lot of reps running the power play. And it sounds simple, but most people don't do that. Most people don't get the reps they need to get. Most people don't lab the stuff they need to lab. Most people don't understand why things work and why things don't, as I'm just getting bad because I'm talking too much. And so that's kind of something that I want to change um, about my game and something I'm trying to change more intentionally. So be intentional with your play calls. Uh, the, there, there's a – with any power play in Madden, and I honestly think, too, like this is – it's all about knowing, like, your weaknesses, I think, too, or part of it as, I, as, I, as my great special teams career just continues to shine. So – you have to understand what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. For example, in double post, one of the, 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 the major strengths of the play is the fact that it attacks a lot of different spots on the field. But a couple weaknesses. Number one, it's a five-out play generally. Um, it's kind of hard. You can run double post with a blocked running back or a blocked tight end. But I would say the most optimal play setups of double post typically are five-out plays. So it can be susceptible to pressure, as you saw um, he was sending some pressure every now and then he got in on me even b before I could throw the ball to my players. The strengths, uh, again, like I said, attacks intermediate can really do a good job of being able to get you, uh, I mean, just beat so many coverages, just literally beat so many things. But one of the weaknesses is um, it's a five out play. Another one of the weaknesses is, especially with the base setup, like the main setup of double post where you're just streaking or fading the slot receiver. One of the biggest weaknesses of that is that there's really nothing that attacks the left side flat. And the C route is good by itself. And honestly, I actually think you can throw the C route more than uh, – I shouldn't have gone for the pick. Um, you, you can actually throw the C route more than you might think. But inevitably, it doesn't have a pull route for the C route typically. So the C route can be a little bit weaker. Um, the C route's going to be really good against like double Mabel coverage, but it's not going to be super effective against some of the more stock defenses, I would say. Stock man, stock cover three, stock cover four, unless you can throw, unless you can throw the C route really, really well against an outside third. But again, if that outside third has deep out and medium, medium route or medium deep zone and, and um, deep out zone and mid zone KO, I think it's going to be hard to, to throw that consistently. So those are that's what I'm talking about. Like you got to be aware of what stops your play. What are the adjustments that they can do? As freaking Harold Carmichael is in quicksand because of the worst patch in Madden history. Oh, this fatigue stuff is terrible. 
So you have to understand what beats you and why, or what are you susceptible to and why. What can they do? You have to start to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Look at my team. Oh, my gosh. This is going to be great. Even though we're winning by 14, we still are just exhausted. The team is just exhausted at the end of the day. There's just no rest for the weary, I guess. Um, so, anyways, back to what I was saying. So, you have to understand, like, what, what beats you and why does it beat you? Or what stops you and why does it stop you? What, what can they actually do? Once you start to... Th- to kind of see the game from your opponent's perspective and actually understand like, okay, they can do this, this, and this. These are the options. These are the possible things they can do um, to stop me. Now, you may every now and then come across something that you've never seen before. Most of the time, though, I would say, you know, the best players in the world do the what the best players in the world do, and most people know what that is. Um, they just don't necessarily, I think, all the time understand why it is. And I think that's kind of more of the... Of the, of the thing you need to do. I don't know why I can't catch the interception or jump or animate, maybe because I'm tired. But with that in mind, why would I not call double post if he's not calling a defense that stops double post, right? So if he's not sending a blitz or if he's not sending a, setting up a specific coverage defense that stops double post, why would I ever call anything but double post, right? Would It would be wasteful, basically. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have purpose. It wouldn't have attention. It would be completely wasteful unless, you know, you're actually getting bagged. So that's part A. And then part B is, okay, so he's bagging double post. What does that mean is probably going to be open? And that's where you have to kind of get into the if this, then that game of Madden and understand, okay, if they actually can adjust to this power play, it means that they're probably doing some very specific things that are going to take it away. So that's where the secondary setup of double post is really, really, really good, where you run the little basically left side flood concept with the, the, the tight end on the drag and then the running back on the wheel. Now, in this guy's example here, he's actually running kind of a, a blitz heavy defense. We'll see if he stays with it. But see here, it doesn't hard flat on the left side, so I can take the tight end drag. That, that right there just in of itself, that simple thing of they don't hard flat the left side, it opens up a lot of other stuff because, for example – if they don't hard flat, if they start to hard flat the left side, then that means that this setup might be open a little bit more with little running back Texas right underneath. Now he's just not making any adjustments, so it's just stock cover three every play. So we'll just go ahead and take our touchdown. But again, you see what I'm kind of getting at is you have to think through as a play caller. I think it's so underrated why you actually are going to call your counter play or why you actually are going to call your constraint three play. And it typically has to come from they stop my power play by doing these couple of things, these possible variables that they could do. They could man up, for example, if you were going to try to stop verticals, you could man up the tight end, use the crosser, and have a shaded down vert hook. That'd be a decent way to stop verticals. So if you man up the tight end and you have a shaded down vert hook, then that probably means that it's not going to be able to stop a slot corner route from like curl flat, for example. So then you could call that play, and now now they have to kind of think about, okay, i got to stop that, but I also got to stop this. And that's where you can really start to, I think, just play really, really, really good Madden because you start to actually anticipate and understand why things are the way they are, and there there is actually a logic behind it, a reason behind it, versus just coming out and um, you know calling whatever play feels good. So just something I've been trying to do better. Now, if you um, apply that logic to defense – I've been trying to think of how to apply that logic to defense. Um, The biggest thing is understanding, in my opinion, like you have your base setup for whatever formation that you're facing. So uh, you have like, I've talked about it a little bit before, but there's basically five ish formations in Madden. There is two by two spread, two by two compression, three by one spread, three by one compression. And then kind of a newer formation. That's a little, you could either say like, I used to say just five wide, but what I'm starting to think through more, a little bit more just because of the meta, just because of what we've been seeing all season long is like, okay, we got to have probably a, a little bit of a plan for, you know, any kind of quads, uh, any kind of quads type set. Uh, I do think it's important to have a plan for that. So that's a that's an example of but again, at the end of the day, like conceptually, there's mainly like five ish uh, core formations because you have three by one compression and that could be bunch. That could be bunch tight end. That could be bunch uh, Y flex. That could be uh, bunch nasty. That could be bunch strong nasty. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of the idea is you have these basic like, OK, these frameworks of how you see this and you've got like five ish formations. 
And out of those five formations, um, you have maybe three to five ways that you like to defend it. We did a video last year. I'll probably bring it back this year, actually. We did a video last year talking about like the five fundamental adjustment concepts in Madden. I think we did it at the beginning of this season, actually, as well. But the five fundamental adjustment concepts in Madden, what's really important to note about that is there are like kind of general tips for really effective adjustments. For example, the double Mabel coverage, very effective adjustment, one of the most popular this year. Um, another one would be cross manning, um, another uh, using cross man to kind of create different types of brackets and stuff like that. Um, try to remember what the other ones were. Roll coverage is really, really good. Um, that's in essence kind of what we're doing out of dollar where we're rolling the one of the safeties into a middle third of the other safety is rolling either into a cloud flat, a hook curl. You could even roll him into an outside third. Kind of an example of this would be cover three cloud. And then um, the other two, I'm kind of drawing a blank. Crossman, double Mabel, roll coverage. And then I can't remember what the other ones are off the top of my head. I have to, I have to go back and rewatch that those videos. But – Essentially, there are these like fundamental concepts that you can create, like base coverages that you want to run. How do you defend the spread? What are some things? What are some key tips for defending spread versus what are some key tips for defending bunch? They're different formations. So defensively, while some concepts can transfer over, you have to kind of think, okay, well, you know, they're different. For example, as you can see right here, I'm manning up the slot receiver so that I don't have to worry about a seam streak over there. Get a nice little illegal contact, just the greatest thing ever. Playing great defense, and I've somehow given him seven points. Um, you know, but anyway, things like that. So you have your base foundational coverages that you want to run. Maybe you have two or three, right? Well, in the in the idea of like power counter constraint from an offense perspective, from a defensive perspective, you have to know. Okay, these are some things that I'm vulnerable to when I run this defense. Um, I think that is uh, super, super underrated. Because if you don't do that, then what ends up happening is you never really know why you're getting beat. You just know you're getting beat, you know, and, and then you don't know. So because you don't know why you're getting beat, you don't know what to do about getting beat, and you don't know where to actually try to adjust. So those are all just kind of some things I've been thinking about in terms of just the game and trying to understand the game in a little bit deeper of a level and also trying to figure out how you can actually have a little bit more logic to your play calling and to why you do what you do so that it actually can be more replicatable. The more logical it is, the more replicatable it'll be. So uh, those are just some things. Hopefully uh, you guys you know, might have related to one of those. I'm curious what you guys think. Another thing I've been thinking about, I put a poll out on my YouTube page. If you guys haven't commented on the poll, you can uh, just go over to the YouTube page and check that out on the community tab. But I've been wondering, why is it in Madden? Like basically, for as long as I've been playing Madden, which I started like really doing YouTube in Madden 12, I did play Madden before it, but I wouldn't say I was like super serious. Probably the most serious I was before Madden 12 was probably Madden uh, Madden 11 was probably like the the where I really started to get like pretty into the game and learn a lot of stuff and tried to learn as much as I possibly could. But literally for as long as I've been playing Madden, uh, Bunch has been probably without a doubt the best offense. So what I've started to kind of wonder, and this is what I put the poll out, is like why are Bunch style offenses always the best? Pretty much always. Um, it's not necessarily like last year, tight was pretty meta. Uh, tight was obviously probably the best offense. But even at that, like compression sets in general, whether it be bunch, tight, um, you know, trips tight in was really good. I think in Madden, I don't remember what it was as far as like a top tier meta offense. I think it was Madden 21 uh, was back when uh, J wall won the club championship with trips tight in. And I think spamming, that was when spamming buttons started to kind of come up was I believe Madden 21 in the summertime running trips. And so trip side in was kind of one of the better offenses in Madden 21. Um, but really outside of that, outside of like a couple of isolated scenarios, for the most part, look, look at that. Look at that catch. Um, for the most part, bunch has been, you know, a bunch style of offense has pretty much been the best offense, like literally ever, every single year. So, you know, you're kind of left to think, okay, we'll wonder why that is. And a couple different observations. I think number one, bunch does provide 
really good routes. Like the double post route is a route that you don't really see out of a lot of playbooks. It has double that kind of route. It has these uh, C routes on the solo side. The formation itself, I remember, I think I heard W do a video on this. I can't remember when he did this. This guy literally is just going to run cover zero. So we're going to go to this setup. Um, but I can't remember when W did this video breakdown on this. But essentially what he said I thought was really interesting was, but bunch is always going to be good as a formation because it's spread on one side, compression on the other. So you're getting, you're getting a combination of a compression set on one side and a spread set on the other side, which allows you the most amount of, I don't know that he said this, but I kind of concluded this. And that by very nature allows you the most amount of ways to attack defenses because you're attacking them from two different fundamental uh, formation concepts. So kind of interesting to think about. I don't know. What do you guys think? Why has Bunch always been really a good offense? My man TNT just, I mean, you got to say, if you can't say anything about my man TNT, he's got some fight. I just think the dollar defense also, um, I've been thinking about this as well. Like what makes dollar so good? And obviously every single defense, you have to have the threat of pressure. So the fact that we're able to create um, pretty effective blitzes, uh, for lack of better uh, word, but just like effective blitzes at the end of the day, we're able to create effective pressures. I don't know how that hook curl actually played that. I haven't seen it play that yet uh, on that crosser. We're able to create effective blitzing concepts. You have all kinds of different blitzing concepts in dollar. I talked about this last year. There's pretty much, I think there's like five fundamental blitzing concepts as well in Madden. Uh, basically, you have slot corner pressure, which would be like DB Fire 2. Um, you have, what's the other one? You have crossfire pressure, uh, which hasn't been super popular over the last couple of years, but it was really good in Madden 18, Madden 7, or Madden 18 and Madden 19, which was the nickel 335 odd crossfire. But there is a way to do that same basic thing um, conceptually out of dollar and out of 146 style formations as well. So, because they literally had to play crossfire, that's pretty much all you need to do it. And then uh, this year, or there was loop blitzing, which was really good at the beginning of the year. And, or I'm sorry, not loop blitzing. I it was called loop blitzing, but really the concept was just stacking content, contained stacking, where you were blitzing your slot corners, bringing them off the edge, and stacking them on the hips of the defensive ends and containing. Then there was um, just standard edge pressure. That's what I would call 4-3, even 6-1, where you just basically are overloading the center. This was really good in Madden 17. It was the nickel blitz 2. Um, it was also really good in Madden 20 as well. And, um, the contain stacking really good has been really good last for really almost every year. Um, it was really good in Madden 21. It was really good in Madden 22. It was really good in Madden 23. Really good in Madden 24. So um, there was another kind of what I would call more of an actual loop blitz that was really good in Madden 22. And um, it was the – drawing a blank on the, the, the name of it. It was the dollar uh, or the dime 236 will formation. And the dime 236 will formation had a play called, I want to say, edge blitz 2. That – concept is in dollar as well so you have and, and that's what i would say is more so what i would call like a traditional loop blitz because they were actually looping around um the tackle on a contain which was really really good so anyways you have loop blitzing crossfire blitzing contain stacking standardized edge pressure slot corner pressure um and then really what i would i would say the dollar a gap blitz this year, it's a little bit more resemblant of kind of almost like a crossfire, honestly, the way it practically plays. But um, it's not necessarily, it's really not specifically a crossfire. Um, in fact, this blitz, this type of a blitz hasn't been really good in Madden since I believe Madden 25, uh, which was like, I think actually like technically Madden 14, Madden 25 next gen, when they went to PlayStation 4, um, the mid zone blitz, I remember that was really good. You could basically, I think it was like three people over the A gap. It was like out of nickel 245. And it was the same kind of thing where the middle linebacker, the blitz angles were just really good. And I believe it would cause disengages and A gaps, kind of like what we're seeing. Um, develop here later in the Madden season this year. So those are kind of some of the main concepts for blitzing. But what I think is really interesting about dollar and why dollar is always such a good formation is it pretty much has the majority of ways to blitz. It has slot corner pressure. It has loop pressure. It has crossfire pressure, has the ability to stack, contain stack. Um, in this example, it has what we would, what I would categorize as like I said, you know, like a, like a little a gap, type of loop almost type pressure. So 
it just has everything from a formation that you can ask for. And I think that's what makes it so good. Kind of like Bunch. Bunch just has the best routes at the end of the day. Um, for the most part, without fail, Bunch has really, really good routes. One of the things that's really important to say about Tight is Tight was really good, but Tight wasn't like top tier meta until the route chemistries came in. So if you remember the first tournament, uh, Henry won the first tournament. Hey, I think he actually won the ultimate kickoff the last two straight years. But in Madden 22, the ultimate kickoff tournament, he was running Washington Bunch. He would audible to tight situationally, but it was primarily working the C route out of Bunch last year at the beginning of the year. Now, and then, and then of course, fast forward, and then tight slots was so good at the towards the end of last year. Tight slots was really good. If you think about it again, we got a bunch of route chemistries. We we're able to put slot apprentice posts out there. We we're able to get the slant post going. We we're able to put corner routes to both sides. Ultimately, tight uh, offset tight end, I think, was the most powerful formation. And the fact that you had the double corner concept, you had the, and then you had, I think, arguably, and that Saints end post was actually very similar to the bunch offset double post post route. So just kind of fascinating to me in terms of just how the formations all, you know, like, you know, how do, how do they, how do we always arrive at these kind of similar uh, formations, these similar passing concepts. I think there's really about five ish um, main stream passing concepts. And that has been, Oh, he's out of there. And that has been the truth for as long as I've been playing Madden. Literally there's been, I've actually gone back and done some a significant amount of research but if you actually look at the concepts that people have been running in the MCS since it started, and even before that in most tournaments, but especially in the MCS era, you basically arrive at like five-ish passing concepts. You have a slant post concept or, or drag post. I call it a shallow cross concept because it's conceptually kind of the same thing. So you basically have a slant post concept. You have a street corner flat concept, a street crosser dig concept which would be Y cross street crosser or street corner flat to me is sale street crosser dig is Y cross. Um, and then you have kind of like a, what I call like a triangle concept or a stick concept where you typically have like a, a hitch, a post and a flat type of thing. Um, in recent years, people have kind of gone away from hitches in general because they don't beat man coverage. And in, you know, there's a lot more, a lot more what we get to today's Madden's, is these like hybrid defenses where it's man and zone or, uh, you know, we cross man certain players, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the defense that we see today, which is honestly um, the thing about it is the gameplay, not, not like the Madden game, like the, the console, but the players continue to get better. What most people don't understand about Madden um, especially I think is the caliber of players has really always continued to go up. Pretty much every single year, I think players in general are getting better. They're learning more about the game. They're figuring things out that they never knew before. Uh, I, that's just kind of my two cents on that because I've kind of seen that. I feel like I'm a thousand times better than I was um, when I first started doing content back in, I think it was, like I said, I think it was Madden 12 was my first year. Let's see if I can fit that in with set feet lead. Um, yeah, so, you know, so so anyway, the caliber of player consistently goes up. And so and the game or the uh I was trying to think of the wording. Uh the schemes inherently also become in uh increasingly more complex every year. Schemes, especially defensively, um they become increasingly more complex every single year. The de the type of defense that we see played on the main stage in most comp tournaments at this point it's like really, really good defense. Like people, even though they don't actually get a stop, you would be amazed if you actually watch the MCS film and really dive into what they're doing and why they're doing it, you would probably be shocked at how good they actually are, both offensively and defensively, but mainly defensively because it kind of gets overshadowed because we're playing such an offensive heavy game that – most people really, I don't know how I played that on the pit. I should have just ran with the quarterback. Um, most most people, they just don't even realize all of the things that they're doing on defense pre-snap to try to get a stop. But it's just, again, it's just we're playing a very, very much so offensive-heavy uh, game. 
So because of that, then it kind of gets overshadowed. I mean, you just, you just kind of miss it. Like, um, you, just, you just miss it. I mean, even the even the best offensive players in the world, when you hear them talk about the game, they are so much more uh, defensive-minded than you might think, or they're smarter on defense than you might think, even though when you watch them play in the MCS, they really don't get stops. Um, and that just kind of speaks to how, to a degree, how great they actually are on the other side of the ball as well. So those are just all kind of like just different types of reflections about the meta over the years. I just think it's kind of interesting. Um, like I said, why bunch style formations like this year, if you think about the best offenses in the game this year, bunch offset and bunch strong offset and bunch strong nasty. Those are the clear cut. Can't argue with it. Best formations in the game. hundred percent. You can literally take that to the bank. That that check can cash it. Um, the only offense that is even close is the bubblegum offense out of RPOs. And the cool part about the Colts playbook is you actually have some of the best RPOs in the game. You have trips tied in. You have um, bunch nasty has a good RPO in it. So kind of fascinating to me because you have, um, like I said, you just have these kind of formations that always seem to. Uh, find their way to the top might not start that way and it might be differently too that's another thing um it might be differently like when is the last time you've seen bunch ran with a tight end apprentice haven't seen that probably in a while but most comp players this year have a tight end apprentice when they run bunch um you know when when's the last time we've seen um uh, like a running back apprentice be so important i don't think since madden 21 you know so just different things like that that uh, kind of contribute to the meta uh, being what it is. Kind of interesting. So when you're playing somebody like this, kind of running just the most random stuff I've ever seen, I, this guy's got heart. He must know I'm recording because he's got heart. Out here just balling 57 to 14, you know, no big deal. The fatigue glitch has to get patched. I don't know how we are. I think that didn't that happen like one week ago? Like we're a week in. To this stupid fatigue glitch. I mean, it's literally the worst patch I've ever, probably the worst patch in my history because it literally didn't do anything except break the game. It literally didn't do anything for the game, negative or like it didn't do any, it wasn't like, it wasn't, <laughs> defense was already in a bad spot. And then they did this fatigue glitch and now it's in a real bad spot because like I remember, I played somebody today and my, I think, I, I think I did this in this game, but. My user was literally in quicksand, like just straight up quicksand. Also, notice just how fast those guys are reacting on those outside corners. It's because they have, in my opinion, it's because of mid zone KO. Mid zone KO is, is really, really good. Let me see if I can throw this. Oh, that's crazy. You can actually throw everything with set feet lead. He had a third over there, but he was backed off. This guy just backed off cover three, man. I don't know if that's going to get the job done. Here we go. Now we're pressing up. Let's see. This man. I'm going to throw it. Oh, I'm going to throw a pick. <laughs> oh, even when I throw a pick, they just swat the ball. Man, that C route kind of drives me insane. It's such a weird route. It just doesn't – I don't love this C route from double post. I wish I did. I just feel like I can't ever get it to be – and I just might not know how to use it right. I just feel like I can't ever get it to be super consistent. All right, let's see. Is he going to go man blitz here? If he goes man blitz, the running back will be open or the tight end will be open. Tight end's open. Boom. So you see kind of what I'm saying? Like you have a pre-snap. Okay, I'm kind of anticipating he's going to do this. So if he does this, then this is going to happen. I think that's like such a underrated thing to do. And I know it sounds super simple, but to me it's 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 never really come easy for me to do that. And I don't know if it's because I just don't think about it when I'm playing or I don't know. So I think it's possible in Madden definitely to overthink things and underthink things as well. And I feel like I've done both. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't know how that just happened to me. Oh, uh, we got to look at the replay right there. That was a crazy animation. Let's take a look at that. All right. So let's see. Brother clicked on to the DT. And just got a D-line pick. There it is. I see what I'm saying about double post. <laughs> the one weakness, I think, at double post, if you get screamed at, I mean, 
you can you can definitely make reads. I mean, I I put up fifty seven points, but I don't know, man. The double post against Cover Zero. I mean, I could have probably thrown the tight end, but pretty pretty interesting. Should have just gone to Wide Trail. Wide Trail kills Cover Zero. Wide Trail is the best blitz beater, best man blitz beater in the game. All you have to do is either a put your running back on a block and release route. Uh, put your running back on a wheel. Put your running back on anything, and it'll work. We got to redeem ourselves, man. My man TNT is probably going to fight all the way. You know, he's got to put up some fight. He stood up for himself with that pick six. All right. A little double post. I'm surprised he's able to blitz if his team is tired. Go to wide trail. A little quick snap, see if it works. I have it. I just can't. Ugh, that's frustrating. This guy's literally just sitting six, calling it good. I don't know why I'm not able to block this with this. Let's throw it. Let me throw my wide open player. Thank you. And that is why man blitz is terrible this year. <laughs> you could throw a drag and you just out of there. I mean, Jordan Addison, 97 speed. Jordan Addison's actually kind of terrible, to be honest. I need to get I need to get Calvin. I just I just can't justify the coins, man. This this Ghost of Future team is so expensive. I'm actually thinking of selling all my playoff cards. I guess the only card I would probably sell would be Ryan Neal. That's of any real value. The rest of them are all like, you know, 50k if that. But the problem is this ghost the ghost of much mutt future, the fifty out of fifty mutt future is the best I it's the best team. And it's definitely I think it's gonna be the best team for a while. That's why I'm actually willing to go build it, is because I hate doing mutt theme teams and stuff, but I mean you can't argue with ninety eight speed or whatever. Calvin will be ninety nine speed on the team. Also, here's a little tip I saw I saw. Actually, I'll, I'll hold on to that. Uh, shade down will make that hook curl play seam streaks. And it, I forgot. I didn't get the shade down off. But when you shade down that hook curl against like a formation like he's running, then if you re-curl flat your – I'll show you what I'm talking about. So like here, so I'm going to shade down the yellow, and then I'm going to re-curl flat these guys. What that does – is it'll make your curl flats play a little bit more aggressive than they normally are, but it will also uh, allow you to press slot receivers. So, like if I was playing spread, I always take my my defense off a of baseline when I play spread formations, and then I just basically um, like like he's in double tier. See, I'm on default. So watch this. Watch the slot receiver. You'll see here if he runs like a vertical route. So you see here, I put the curl flats back out there. I shade it underneath first. Well, see how he jams him, and that takes away the seam streak. So with the combination of the curl flat and the hook curl um, will do a really good job of taking away a seam streak. So now all you have to worry about is the right side, which is where the tight end is. And then obviously, as you see, we have the really nice blitz behind it. So this makes it really easy to stop spread sets. Anytime there's a defensive, like a, a defense that becomes like super meta, the main reason why it's so um, meta and what it does fundamentally is it it cuts off like a the majority of the way? Can I get a KO right there, please? That's deep end zone. Um, there you see there again, like mid zone would have knocked that out because I don't have mid zone. He didn't knock it out, and I didn't get my curl flat adjustment off there on the right. It would have pressed it as you see right there. Um, okay, so what I was saying about what was I talking about? I totally lost my train of thought as I was trying to make my adjustments. That's the one thing that's low-key super hard about playing gameplays or doing gameplay videos is sometimes you forget what you're saying because you're, you're so into the game. But anyway, um, oh, yeah, yeah, defensive meta. So it cuts off the majority of what people want, ma ma the majority of what we call random uh, formations. Like formations like this, you just – this formation, I just – I mean, I'm sure there's a way to run it. But it's just not very good against this defense. Like this defense right here, that's all you basically have to do. You shade underneath, 
and then you repurple that guy. And as long as he's pressing that slot receiver, they'll never be able to throw a seam streak to the left side. Obviously, if they have RPOs or something, yes, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Okay. Um, and then if you want to make the blitz a little better, you can back that guy off. I'm going to sit here in case he throws that again. Oh, no. And there we go. But I got 10 sacks. Dude, Gronk just out here setting records. Dude, Gronk, Gronk, Gronk is probably the best A-gapper. I hate that he's a million coins, but he's probably the best A-gapper. I don't think this guy is going to adjust to this play. Yep, no safety help. He keeps thinking there's probably, he probably keeps thinking that that guy's going to go to save, help him, but he's not. And there it is. Boom. My man TNT just showing some massive fight. We're dropping 70 out here. I don't, I don't think I've dropped. Most people quit. I'm shocked he's still in this game. And the fact that he has 21 points is honestly kind of an indictment on me. Not just, we just got to be better, man. We just got to play better defense. You know, we can't make these we can't make these bad mistakes, bad turnovers. We're kind of like the, the real NFL Cowboys. You know, we, we just shoot ourselves in the foot. The fact that the Cowboys lost to the Packers – is is like terrible, like terrible. Um, I mean, it's terrible for everybody. People are gonna lose jobs, and they honestly probably should. I mean, the Cowboys. This was like the year, man. This was definitely the year they had home field. There was no like the Niners were good, but they weren't like like the Niners were good, but they were there's they have weaknesses. I actually think. The Packers have a legitimate shot at beating the Niners. I really do. And I don't really like the Niners. I like their coach, but I don't really like them as a as a team, you know. Look at that hook curl. Can't catch the pick, but he's there. <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of people playing with this Michael Vick today, too. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just Tuesday Madden. Tuesday Madden, you know, Gronk. <laughs> Got 11 sacks. He just won't block the blitz. He won't do anything. This guy just doesn't understand. He just, at the end of the day, he's, a, he's an example of what we're talking about. We're just calling random play. He's just calling the most random plays trying to beat this. And that's where, like, defense is a little bit different than offense. Like, offense every now and then. Like, like I do think there's definitely value, especially on offense, and just, like, kind of tweak. Like, every now and then, like, attacking a different part of the field or, like, kind of subtly tweaking your play call. Look at that. Look at that fatigue. That's my left defensive end. He's on 1%. I think that's Terrell Suggs, by the way. Um, but anyway, um, I do think there's like an actual logic. I don't know why I keep running back. I keep thinking he's going to throw that slant, but he never does. Uh, maybe it's because I'm running back. There's a logic to like just doing kind of random stuff just to kind of tweak it. There it is, deep end zone KO, doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Like to just kind of every now and then tweak your play call, it kind of depends on your opponent. If you're playing somebody good, I think you do need to do that. And the reason why you need to do that is because you need to um, force them to have to defend the whole field. So if you're calling an offensive play that is only defending like a certain section of the field, then you're really – you need to be attacking other places as well. Um, otherwise, if, if you don't do that, then they can kind of sit on whatever it is that you're doing. So you have to kind of think that out as well. So I do think there's, but but defense. If you if you have a defense and they're not able to beat it, you should never get out of that defense. Literally never. <laughs> um, you need to be running that defense over and over again. And the reason why is because it's so hard to get a stop in this Madden. And if you can get a stop, you 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 want to force them to have to show you that they can beat it. Now, obviously, the best players in the world, of course, you're going to have to mix things up. You're going to have to – I feel like when you're playing, like, the really good players, um, even good players, like, compared to you, you have to use anticipation so much more than you think you do. Um, you have to really try to, like, okay, he's probably going to call this or based off the adjustments or based off where he's at on the field, he's probably going to call this play. So I need to set up – I need to put a cloud flat instead of a hard flat or, or whatever. Those are kind of some of those things that, like, over time you have to kind of just – I don't know, for lack of a better word, figure out. It's not, I wouldn't say figure out, though, because you have to kind of lab. You have to kind of lab. You have to kind of know, like, this beats that. Right back to me. So – and you have to understand, like – with any defense, like, again, kind of back to what I was saying in the beginning, but, like, what can they actually do? Like, where can they hit you at? 
Like he's in this formation double, so I know what do I got to watch out for here. I got to watch out for a tight end corner out. I got to watch out for uh, a slant from the slot receiver, you know, some kind of post from the right receiver. Those are some of the things that could probably give this defense a little trouble. Outside of that, like the left side is pretty much dead because of that pre- because of the press. Because of the press I can get on that curl flat, um, it's really hard to hit me to the left, especially in the seam. And then I gotta, I gotta, tr- I'm paying for the ability, so I gotta trust the KO. You know what I mean, dude? My team is so gas. Look at these players. I'm gonna, I'm definitely not, I'm not taking Gronk out of the A gap though. He's got to be the blitzer. We'll put uh, Roquan in. He'll be in. He'll be in for one play. Actually, did not get anything set. I'm still going to get a bag. See, that's the mid zone KO. Had that not been mid zone KO, he wouldn't have activated. That's why I just think those are the two best abilities, and they just play good. They really do. They play. They play everything for me anyway. If someone was running man against double post, I don't know how I'd beat it. I'd probably do this setup, but I don't know what I would do with R1 because a streak's really not. I mean, you can, it can be, man. Little cover two. All right, TNT. We got a minute left. I might, I, I kind of want to try to score 100 points. I don't know if I can. Can I drop 100? I literally just booted up. I'm in Legend Division. <laughs> I'm in Legend Division. I've been in Legend Division. The. We know the head-to-head matchmaking is subpar this year, to say the least, but dropped 85. I don't think I've ever dropped this many points in a game of Madden like, against like just a random well, – I guess I have, but not like this. This is – and I'm, I've actually not played the best. Like my offense has kind of been – my reads have kind of been slow. I mean, he's just literally running over Storm Bray. I mean, he's every now and then he'll change his coverage, but it's – He's not using anything. He's not really adjusting anything. I'm trying to decide if Colts is better than Jets, and I just can't. I just don't know. I just don't know. If you look at the belt winners, Abram runs Jets, pretty sure. John Beast runs Colts. Henry runs Colts. Uh, who won the last one? Mr. Football. He runs Colts. I'm trying to remember who else won a belt this year. Kobo runs trips, so he's kind of an outlier. He's running the ball. Man, you've been fighting all this time. Also, a little quick tip for those of you that are watching, if you're still watching the video because this is an absolute blowout. I actually think this makes the blitz better, and it's a simple little tip. Uh, Trey open. Let me try man line against it. Um, simple little tip to make this blitz better. With your user... Stand right here, hold left trigger. I actually, I I thought for a while this year, maybe the more so in the beginning of the year, I don't know. I think it mainly had to do with edge pressure and the 6-1 blitz. But basically, um, this, this makes this, uh, so I'm standing right here. I'm going to hold left trigger, and I'm just going to kind of run right here. I think that makes it super hard for that blitz to consistently get picked up. Once again, if you take a look at that seam streak, that's super popular to be thrown. Mid zone KO does what we needed to do. I think it's the best, the best cocktailed ability wise. So this is one of my favorite defenses for trips. Um, I didn't get it off my curl, curl flat. Look at mid zone. Look at mid zone out there. See, he's trying to throw the streak. I don't know. Vic might not have the ability to throw it. Um, but I'll show, I'll show you this really good adjustment for trips. All right, so if you look here, this is pretty good because the hook curl will come down, and he'll kind of defend that, as you see right there. That's not bad. I don't think we're going to get to 100, boys. I'd have to onside. Let's see if I give up a touchdown. We're going to get to 90. We'll probably get to 90. What's – I don't know. This is definitely a touchdown. Let's see here. We'll do a little – a little bit of uh, motion out. Gotta throw it. Gotta throw it. Dang it. <laughs> Man. Run verticals. Vert- I should have ran verticals, honestly. Let's see if he runs man here. Let me 
does. I didn't want him to run. Man, I thought he was going to run. I guess I should have looked at the pre-snap tells. Uh, I don't think we're going to make it, boys. Got to 90. This is 92. Got to get the onside. Got to get the onside, boys. My man TNT just putting up some fight. 21 tonight. 92 to 21. That basically was the score of the Cowboys game yesterday. <laughs> Just uh, it was like just a terrible loss. All right, let's see. I don't know the onside kick method, so we're just we're just gonna go with whatever. Strong onside, I don't know. Speed. I just can't go full power. We're just gonna lay the wood. We're just gonna lay the wood, boys. Perfectly timed fumble. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. <laughs> oh man. Okay. 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 We gotta lock in. He's just going to use the post, and then we're just, all right, all right, all right, all right. Please run main coverage. Please run main coverage. <laughs> please, 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 please. No, be ran cover three. Uh, I don't want to catch it. I don't want to catch it. Oh, I got one timeout. That's actually a terrible play call by me. I should have, I, sh uh, I don't know why I called that. I really want to. I really want to score. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. If he blitzes us, we lost. Oh, I got it. Oh, the stupid bumping in this game. <sighs> so, I uh, just want to do some more gameplays here on the channel. Hopefully, you guys enjoy the video. And uh, like I said, we're gonna be kind of going inside our mind, just talking about why we're doing what we're doing when we're doing it. Um, I feel like this is type of video that I would really benefit from. So hopefully you do as well. So real quick in dollar, I just want to talk a little bit just about the formation in general, why it's so good, what we're doing out of it. So good because of the blitzing threats. Obviously, it's a symmetrical formation, the coverages that you can create. Um, kind of starting out here in my Super Bowl against kind of a formation that I'm not super familiar defending. I want to go ahead and just kind of see what he's doing. A little bubblegum scheme here. And um, kind of was anticipating something like that out of the slot offset. This uh, formation is actually really, really good. I think KMAC ran this in the gulag and i don't know if he won the tournament he might have won the tournament i know he made the finals i'm not sure if he won it um but this formation is really good so um you know kind of coming out i'm just trying to honestly i'm just trying to play a little bit but don't break just kind of see like what are the plays that we're looking at what are the what are the predominant plays that he's going to be running systematically you can tell a lot on your first drive typically when you play somebody on their first drive they're going to show you kind of their bread and butter and so I just don't want to get I just don't want to give up a run play for a touchdown. Um, you want to try to like again just really just make the first drive as long as you can so that you can see the biggest sample size. So I'm gonna be running a lot of cover four here, running a lot of like just simple defense and trying to kind of like force the issue. Let's see if I can get him to throw this to me. Nope. And actually, that's so that's just crazy to me. Okay, so that's exactly what you don't want to have happen. So uh, you know, right there, probably should have blitzed a little bit more. He doesn't really have a seam threat on the left, so we're gonna do this. And I can't. The other thing that's really frustrating about this formation is I can't. I don't think I can hot route or make an adjustment when he starts his like motion snap. I think it literally like freezes your defense and whatever you're in. Uh, to me, that's really frustrating because I might want to make a you know an adjustment off of that, but unfortunately, I just can't. So. I'm going to try this defense out a little bit now that we're getting down here in the red zone, trying to see if we can kind of force the issue a little bit, see if it throws this corner to us. And he actually just <laughs> he actually just did us a huge favor by throwing that. Uh, he actually had the corner route open to the right-hand side, but wasn't able to uh, make that read. So I'm in the Jets playbook in uh, running bunch strong. I really like this formation. been having a lot of fun with this. I think it's a really good standalone formation. You can pretty much run this formation alone and be pretty effective. Now he comes out, he's showing dollar first play. I mainly just want to see kind of what his plan is for this little bubble screen. If he's going to man up circle. Uh, I like to do this pretty much the first play of every game that I play. And a couple of reasons why number one, if you're in the middle of the field, it helps you get on a hash mark. Number two, another little underrated thing it does is it just communicates to them that you're willing to run this play. And then uh, the third thing it does is it forces them to have to respect the fact that you have the bubble screen and they're going to have to start manning people up out of their defense. So kind of just running through some of my favorite plays here 
as I get screamed at as I block six and do the side protection. That's why the eight gap blitz, in my opinion, is so good. So what I want to do is I just want to kind of like literally almost like have like a script of what I want to call. So I want to start with the RPO, go to the corner route play, and then maybe go to this play out of Durham. See here he's not manning up the circle receiver, but he has some kind of KO on Pacheco over there, which I'm really shocked that he has. I don't know why he would have that because Pacheco's best ability is deep out zone KOs, so just kind of interesting. Here, uh, kind of a third and three situation. We're going to audible uh, over here to trips. The main reason why is just because he's pressed up. So I want to see if he can stop this fade route to the left-hand side. If he can't, um, this is going to be good. Awesome. Thank you so much for not allowing me to call my play. I want to do the same basic thing. We'll just do it a little faster here. So I think right there, actually, he showed, did he show blitz? No. I don't know why I can't get the trips here. So uh, if you guys didn't know, there's kind of a glitch in trips where if they're baseline pressed, if that outside corner is an outside third, a lot of times you can actually hit this. And he actually plays really good defense, but he left that open. <sighs> and these just like random sheds, bro. These just random. Uh, that's frustrating. All right, fourth and eight. So fourth and eight situationally, uh, kind of a – you don't want to be on a fourth down in your first drive. I feel like they got kind of two fluky sheds, had wide open players, just couldn't pass the ball to them. Obviously, um, you know, I need to be better, but, you know, just kind of frustrated by that. Anyways, uh, I'm just going to come out quick snipe, corner strike. It's one of my favorite plays in the game right now, just a simple streak right here because this throw to the corner route is very similar to the play stick out of gun bunch. It's almost the exact same corner route. And so they just, like, they have to do a lot to stop the tight end flat and the corner route. A lot of people don't use the tight end flat. I actually think the tight end flat is one of the most underrated parts of that play. Because that flat, um, a hard flat, in my experience, doesn't really defend it. It has to be almost like a stock curl flat. And then that stock curl flat is not really going to do a good job of defending the other stuff that you have. So, um, you know, I like that as well. So you're just kind of going back to double corner. I feel like I had it and uh, just wasn't able to make the throw. Able to make the throw this time, get out of there, and let's see if we can just get in. Unfortunately, we can't. So now we're going to have to go score in the red zone. The red zone, in my opinion, is the hardest place to score in men 24. Uh, sometimes it's free. Sometimes it's not. just kind of depends on who you're playing. Here he kind of shows this little man coverage look on the right. So I'm kind of – you know, kind of planning to run the run the ball, just kind of see if he can stop this run. He's able to do that. So now what we're going to do is go to one of my favorite plays um, down here in the red zone, and that's P boot over. A lot of people don't realize how good of a play P boot over is uh, this year in the red zone, and the main reason why is because of the fact that you can smart route this tight end post, and then you have a little hitch on the left side on the numbers. So it makes this really, really good. As you see, I have the tight end. Let's see if I can make the throw. Wide open, touchdown, and we're off to a good start. Whenever you get a stop and then you're able to get seven, it really does a good job of like just – it just makes it so you're you're playing with a lead, and so it puts a lot of pressure on your opponent. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is making the game as systematic as possible. Um, as you saw right there – in that drive, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't execute at a high level, but I think one of the things that people misunderstand a lot about Madden is you, a lot of people don't really know like why you do what you do and also when you do what you do. Okay. A lot of people know how, like they know the best route combos in the game or they know, they know like double posts is a really good play. They know vertical is a good play, but they don't know why to call verticals versus call double post versus call uh, curl flat. They don't really understand some of those things. And so I want to talk a little bit about that in this video, just in terms of the logical progression um, in Madden. Also, I wanted to say uh, you can actually kind of to a degree apply the same uh, principle uh, to this on defense. So what we're going to do here is we're going to try to stop this. I don't know if we'll be able to. We're kind of really getting adjusting. Of course, he's going to run to the right. I'm going to get out of here and just take this away. Got the guy wide open in the middle field. Yeah, that was pretty bad defense. So um, why do you do what you do, right? I think that's a super, super important thing. I also think, to a degree, at times, it's very possible to make this game more complicated than it has to be. When you have a power play, I talk a lot about the the offensive structure, basically, the way that I structure most of my ebooks, the way that I structure offenses in general, is essentially a power counter constraint. So when I say power counter and constraint, what I mean is you want to have a power play. That's that's a bread and butter play. That's a play that like, you know, that's like double post this year for most people, uh, the double corner route. The, there's a lot of different power plays in, in, in really every formation. Probably if it's a good formation, Madden, it probably has multiple power plays, right? It, if you think about Gun Bunch, for example, and I'm just using that because, you know, we know, but we kind of know what we're getting with, with Bunch. Um, 
if we just use Gun Bunch as kind of like a, an explanation for what good offense is, because it's been one of the best offenses for the last probably at least 10 years. It's been it's literally been good since I've been doing YouTube. So since Madden 12, it's been very effective. Um, but anyway, if we just if we just use let me just throw this wheel. So you threw that last time. If we just use Gun Bunch as kind of like a, a base point or a baseline of like what makes a good offense in Madden. We know that there are um, number one. You need you need to be able to attack the whole entire field with your routes. So the routes on your on your play, you you have to have the ability to attack the whole field. If you can't attack the whole f whole field, I think it's a it's a significant disadvantage um, offensively. So the first thing is you need to be able to attack um, the entire field. So that's having posts, crossers, corners, um, stuff like that. Obviously, Hot Route Master can kind of help some of that. Ah, good read. Uh, obviously, Hot Rod Master, I probably should have purpled that guy. Hot Rod Master can certainly help that a little bit, but it doesn't wholesale like like you also have formations in general, you know, that can that can do this. I keep messing up my adjustments, bro. It's kind of frustrating. OK, so. And then the, the thing about the power play is there is typically if a power play is good, like, for example, this year, double post, just streak the slot receiver. Um, this is one of the best plays in the game. OK, so. If that power play is truly a good power play, which that play, power play is certainly a really good power play, right? Then all you have to do, let me see if I can get there. That's crazy to me that that was a completion. All you have to do is you have to understand like what stops it and why. Obviously, this takes a little bit of lab work, but when you actually stop and you know kind of think from a defensive perspective, what stops double post is typically. Um, it, it, is typically a kind of a cover two base defense, maybe um, essentially like a deep half on the solo side with a cloud to take away the the C route. Like there's kind of a cover two on the solo side, and then almost like a cover four uh, on the on the other side. So those kind of like a basic understanding of of what actually stops, uh, what actually plays double post decently, right? So with that in mind, what are your counter plays to your power play? Maybe a way to beat cover two on the solo side or, um, you know, just different things like that. Those are the kind of those are the kind of things you want to think through when you're developing an offense. So when someone actually does stop your power play or they show the capability to stop your power play, typically it leaves them vulnerable to something else. So the way that I equate this to the real NFL is Vince Lombardi uh, is famous for running what's known as the Packers sweep. And the Packers sweep, basically, if you think it out, um, the Packers sweep essentially had like certain defenses that would be able to stop it. And I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head, like how to actually explain how they would stop it. But essentially, the main defense that was really, I think, almost kind of to a degree created to stop it was the 4-3 flex defense. Um, this was the defense that Tom Landry invented. If you guys didn't know, uh, Tom Landry and Vince Lombardi were actually the, on the same coaching staff. Um, and so they kind of went up, you know, they kind of learned, they kind of came up together. I can't believe he completed that. Um, so they kind of came up together in their in their coaching staff. And so essentially what that meant for a practical practically is they had to understand what each other were doing on both sides of the ball, how to counter that. And then also the other kind of thing about that is there were certain things that when you were able to counter the power play, though, it left other things open. If you know the four, three flex defense, what it essentially is, is it's very similar to I don't have it here, um, but it's very similar to like four, three, even six, one. Right. So with four, three, even six, one, essentially what would happen is the essentially they would have like a kind of a, a lane open to run the ball right down the middle. So a lot of teams would use the play traps, traps or counter plays to kind of gaps, basically gap scheme runs uh, to be able to to counter that. Right. So. That was, in essence, oh, thank God I stopped him. I'm so thankful that I stopped him right there. I thought he was going to get in. So it, it, that that at its core is kind of the basics of schematics, if you think about it. And then they would run play action off of that as well. So if you were you know bringing too many people down the box, uh, you, I think we're pretty. Uh, if you guys watch any NFL film, you'll see the Packers in the Super Bowl against the Chiefs, and there were just so many post routes open because the safeties were coming down, um, coming down into the box to try to stop the run. So that's kind of just a very basic example of what I would say is power counter constraint. So. Let me let me take it to this here for a second. So RPO alert screen. This would be an example of a constraint theory play because it ensures um, it, it ensures that you're kind of living in a perfect world in terms of like it it, it really 
there's certain specific things they have to do to stop that. But it's not like you wouldn't run an RPO every play. At least I wouldn't. You can, but I wouldn't do that. But then a power play uh, in this example would be this play corner strike, the double corner concept. We know this is one of the best concepts in Madden this year. And so we would run something like this. Let me see if I can make this throw. That's actually a terrible animation. I actually still made it, though. Um, so, so we'd run something like this, and there's certain very specific things they have to do. For example, one of the things they have to do is they have to have a cloud over there on the right side. Um, and it can't be, it, it really needs to be like a cloud flat zone. It, does, it can't be really zone dropped. Um, that's what makes it hard to stop. So then what they become vulnerable to, uh, and that's actually, I have R1. Dang it. Um, I'm not going to risk an overthrow. I've had so many bad overthrows in the last day or two. So they have to basically have like a cloud flat over there on the right-hand side. Now, you saw right there, he backed that guy off. That is a pretty big tell that it's probably going to be double Mabel. This play does a really good job at attacking double Mabel here that I'm about to run. I don't have the right route combo, but we're just going to run it because I think the corner route will win. I actually just backed off man coverage. Appreciate that. So... Back to what kind of the discussion out of corner strike. So there's a specific thing they have to do, right? They have to have a cloud flat over there on the right, or they have to man up circle. The man up of circle also stops verticals. It also stops the RPO screen. So I actually think the, the best way to kind of go about it is to uh, is to man up your outside bunch receiver. However, that creates other problems. So like if I wanted to run the play, now you have to have a hard flat because if I wanted to run the play stick and I just wanted to utilize this tight and flat route, which we'll actually show here, this tight and flat route is super, super good. So they have to kind of anticipate that. They're going to have a hard flat over there for that. You know, so we'll look out here. We'll see if they have a hard flat. Ends up coming inside. And that's terrible. I literally tried to high point that up into the outside. It got stuck. And I just might have lost the game. Oh, wow. I mean, I haven't lost the game, but that's just terrible. That's just terrible. Gosh, that's just stupid of me. I should have just ran the ball. That's it, and that's why people run the ball uh, inside the five. I wonder if this can stop it. Let's see. Let's see. I'm trying to get him to throw. I'm trying to get him to throw a bubble screen here. I don't know if this. I don't know if this stops or not. When you play in someone like this, they're kind of running some. Uh, I need that to stop it. I need that to stop it, bro. Yeah, I guess you have to press up against that. Okay, so 12 seconds, end of half. What do you think we do? Hopefully we just – I probably fair catch here just because of the way he's been playing, try to get in, try to get a big play and then hit a field goal. Yeah, we'll do that. Some people like to run this out. I don't really like to run this out right here. I don't like being in the middle of the field, but you have three timeouts. What you could do is you could call – I don't know. There's a lot of different theories here. I think what we're going to do, see, backed off the corners. I'm just going to call flood, and I'm going to go with this combo. Let's see if I can get it. I'm going to force feed it. Can I get a possession catch, and I can't. <sighs> shame. That's a shame. All right, let's go corner strike with a streak, see what happens, make a read. And it blitzes off the edge. We'll just take our yards. We'll go to trips. Actually, we'll go to bunch tight end here. I actually really like when they come out in three deep. I feel like I have a much better shot than if they're like just in their basic defense this year. Oh, yeah, he's on the D lineman. This could be a tutty. Blue. Rat catch. Touchdown. There it is. Oh, man. this. I mean, there we go. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound right there. So, uh, anyways, back to kind of the discussion on the offensive side of the ball is like, okay, so like if there's a very specific set of things that they can do to stop that, typically what that's going to do is it's going to leave them vulnerable. And so you want to have a second play, a counterplay of sorts, that really takes advantage of what those things are that are going to leave them vulnerable. And the example of bunch strong offset, typically what I've seen is – when they're running those stock cloud flats, one of the best things to do is go to the play Durham because you could put the running back on a streak and that gets up into that soft seam area of the field because typically if they're going to run a cloud flat out there, they're not going to be able to run a vert hook as well. And that vert hook is – I don't normally see a lot of people putting yellow zones on the side of the bunch uh, in bunch strong. I should have fair caught that. Uh, so that's a, that's a big part. Okay. So 
once they start to put like little cloud flats out there to stop the corner route, then it opens up your running back streak up out of the backfield. A lot of people like to cross man that, but I would say cross man is not cross manning the running back is not a hundred percent consistent and not a hundred percent reliable for stopping any route from the running back this year. You know, so you just have to kind of think all that out. And then what that does is as you're starting to play your game, you're saying, okay, what am I getting stopped by? And you know, how's that affecting? Like he's running a lot of backed off clouds here or backed off corners. I think this right here, actually a really underrated version of the double corner because now we put this little tight end quick flat. I wish he would stop getting bumped with a little tight end quick flat. Does a really good job of actually attacking man coverage, which you might not have known that. So, so anyways, those are just some general tips uh, in terms of that. And I just think like it just makes a lot more sense to play like this because there's actually like a plan. You actually have like, okay, here's a, a systematic kind of approach. So let's see if we can get this set up here. I actually kind of like this setup. I don't know if it'll work. Yeah, he may, see how he manned up the tight end? Then I'm able to do stuff like that. So the play that I just ran would be an example of what I would call a constraint theory play. So what a constraint theory play does is it just, like I said, it just ensures that they are they have to respect certain things. So like the the best way I could explain like a constraint theory play is if they start cross manning specific players, like just putting that putting the other player um, on the corner. That's a bad read. That's a bad read. I should have thrown a pick. So just putting the other player on the corner route or putting the other player or, or like in that example there, you know, if they start to man up the tight end a lot, just put the tight end to the flat and throw something else. So just different. Um, those are just some like just basic examples here. Let's see what he's, I don't really know what he's actually doing. Honestly, I feel like he's doing kind of random stuff here. Let's see if we can hit double corner. I feel like he has literally not defended this yet, and he's not going to defend it again. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if this was, like, a real – like, one of the things I probably should have done a little better job on my second drive, especially on this drive, is now that I've kind of seen, like, okay, these are what he's going to – this is, this is kind of his standard stuff, right? I need to be, you know, I need to be, like, kind of locked more locked in on, okay, I need to do this or that. One of the things uh, that I wanted to quickly point out here is he's kind of showing man coverage. I wish I could snap the freaking ball. Um, he's kind of showing man-to-man -man coverage, okay? So what I wanted to do there is go to one of my favorite man beaters. This is play wide trail. I think this is probably the best man beating play in the game this year. Let's see if he does that again. See how he's pressing up like this and getting down underneath. So we can do one or two things. We're going to try to ensure that we're living in a perfect world. So we're going to go to RPO. Actually, a good call because he backed him off last second. Main reason I wanted to do that is I just wanted to actually see is it man coverage. It's first of 15. I can kind of burn a play here. Now that I kind of see what he's doing, um, we're going to go to this and see if we can't just um, – yeah, boom. I mean, he's just not adjusting the double corner. So in a legitimate, like, in, in a very logical way, if they're not going to stop the play, why would you ever call anything other than that, you know? Here, just going to try to see if I can get a cheap touchdown of this RPO. I don't want to throw another interception and waste another red zone opportunity. It literally should be 21-7, to 7, um, or at least, uh, yeah, probably 21-7, to 7, honestly. But it is what it is. Okay, so defensively, how do you play defense here? Well, a couple things you got to think about. And this is where you have to start thinking. This is another little advanced tip that I would I would suggest to people uh, and myself. Again, everything that I say to you guys, I try to teach myself because it's easy to talk about stuff. A lot of times it's really hard to do it. So, uh, so what we're talking about here is we've got about two minutes and 30 seconds left in the game. So chances are on the high end, he's going to have two more possessions. On the low end, he's probably going to have one more possession. So as you're playing defense systematically here, this is where you want to try to basically, in my opinion, you want to try to end the game right here. If you get a stop, the game is basically over as long as you don't play stupid on offense. So I'm going to get a little bit more aggressive. So I might, you know, send more pressure. Now he's going to start going to random stuff, uh, which is his MO. But I'm going to I'm going to start sending a little bit more pressure, trying to see if I can like maybe even maybe even like lurk a little bit more aggressively, like try to like jump stuff and stuff. I think that is um, another underrated thing is like, again, knowing when and when to when to actually try to get your stop. I think a lot of people, um, they don't actually they don't actually do that. Here is kind of an aggressive defense. I put the hard flood out there. It doesn't do absolutely anything. He's able to get out. I mean, that's just stupid to me. Like, I don't I just think that's so stupid. I don't know why he would I don't know why he's not calling that every play because like I don't know what to do. All right, when he does this, he normally runs a corner, so we're going to go to the defense like this. Tight end corner. Oh, crosser. 
Yeah, he probably had the crosser. He just didn't throw the ball. All right, second and 10 situation here. And we're going out here. I'm just going to run out here myself. When they're doing stuff like this, I mean, it's it's kind of honestly. That's a hard flat. He threw right at a hard. Oh, I wish they would wish they would catch that. All right, so fourth and nine. So this is my stop, or this is at least the best chance I've probably had all game at getting a stop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send five to try to gas him up a little bit. And depending on the formation, he's coming out in bunch typically. So if someone is ever just like randomly kind of audibly uh, to bunch, we know that to be verticals. So we're going to try to try to get a little aggressive here against verticals. Let's see. And he throws a stupid seam streak. I hate that. I hate that that's open. Whatever. So now uh, we're going to go back to kind of some more basic bunch defense. Just because, you know, it's like, eh, there's verticals. There it is. There it is. There's Old Faithful. Somehow we're not able to stop it. Hard flats don't hard flat. Okay, so I'm actually a lot more comfortable defending bunch than I, <laughs> than I am against slot offset. So uh, I'm not, I'm actually thrilled that he went to bunch here. We're going to man up the running back. Let's see if this will stop it. Yep, yep, yep. Throw that. Throw that on the left. Yep, good read. That's just random stuff, man. Like, they just do random stuff sometimes. So when you're playing somebody that does random stuff, honestly, the best defense is cover four drop. Now that he's going back to this, I just don't know what to do against a formation like this. I literally don't know. I don't know why DB Fire 2 doesn't stop stuff. Like, you would think just this defense right here would basically stop everything. And you just use her the slot. But it just doesn't, man. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. That is why Lurk Artist is such an important ability, man. You have to have Lurk Artist. So right there, I actually was so thankful that he passed, and I just essentially usered the I usered the slot initially, and then I saw the wheel behind it and just went to that and got my stop. So uh, right here, it's kind of important. You don't want to waste a stop. Like I already wasted one stop this game. So what I mean by ways to stop is to give them the ball back. So three points here is completely fine. The game's basically over if I score three, at least in my opinion. So just kind of playing standard offense. I'm just trying to score. I'm just trying to end the game, essentially. You could, like at this point, go to RPOs. He's going to go ahead and quit out here because I think we're in field goal range. But anyways, those are some tips and strategies that I like to use. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the gameplay. Thanks for watching.